This podcast is in association with the Blast Wing Shooting Kennels, the Rush and the Flush Hunt Club, and is sponsored by American Natural Premium Dog Food, B Mountain Knife Works, and the National Bird Dog Circuit. champ is here. The champ is here. The champ is here. <laughs> we are here back on the Wingmasters podcast to to talk with about the BDC Nationals and update everybody. Man, I'm happy to be back home, but what the hell? I came home to a snow. I left here in the snow and came home in the snow, home in the snow, and it's April 2nd, but we got the champ, Alec Kisley, here that we're going to talk about a little bit later and how he won the national championship but for now let's roll into that a little bit easier so i'm glad we're back to hitting up a podcast again brother welcome back huh oh, oh, we're back together it's gonna be a good one it's gonna be a good one there's a lot to talk about and there's a lot of exciting stuff that that went on at the week of nationals the bdc nationals and i think and for those that are when i'm saying bdc it's the national bird dog circuit so if you want to learn more about it go to nwbdc.com and so I want to start off with the, about talking a little bit about Nationals Week. This was, Alec, this was your first Nationals. And the place that we go to is called Scattered Acres Outfitting. And it's a beautiful place. I'd like to just describe this for one second. It's the, the main building is like probably like, what do you think, 60 by 100? Yeah. It's got At a little least. kitchenette in a corner. It's got a bar in the corner with all these neat chairs. And then the rest of the area is open with... Um, all different tables and chairs for people to sit down and they serve us food each day. It has lodging off of each wings of the building so that you can um, stay right there and get your own room and stay right there if you book in time. They got cabins outside and then outside if people want to camp, they li literally have uh, uh, camping hookups out there. Um, and so it's an awesome facility. And then around the surrounding areas, they got different Airbnbs and hotels within like 15 miles. But when you get there, I mean, I'm lucky one of the people that books mine a year in advance and we were lucky because we stayed there. And you literally get there, park your truck, park your trailer, get your dogs comfortable, and you never leave the site for a whole week straight of bird dogging. And that's one heck of a good time. And it's first class. I don't I don't have to prepare meals or nothing. I just sign up for the meals for the whole week. And uh, every time I know I'm going to have breakfast at 7 in the morning, lunch at noon, and 6 at night, we're fed. So it's awesome. Sheila Rogue owns Scattered Acres, and uh, their staff is amazing. It's a great place. So... Getting the nationals this week is something that I talk about a lot. I've I've written about it. I've written tidbits about it. I've talked to people that have mentored about it. I talked to people who are new in the sport of the game about it. Like you brought Dan Ball down with you. It was his first nationals with you as well. All right, he ran his first time. I'm like, you need to experience a nationals for people that are new players because everybody is there and there's like a really high. Um, anticipation of the week of like who's going to be the national champion and there's so much going on day by day and we're going to kind of walk you through what a nationals day by day is and talk to you about some of the success our breeding program had a really good successful week which is fun to talk about um some of my friends had a lot a good successful week so i think like one cool thing that's fun to talk about is like I, you, you know al kisley here and you hear me talk about tony peterson and craig anderson and justin randy hoffman and you know, and hear me and Tim Samuel said one of my best friends, and you'll hear me mention these guys because we're we're all friends that have the passion about bird dogging, and bird dogging is like a rodeo. I mean, you you travel the country earning points throughout the year to get to the national pot, and then one thing at the nationals too, which is cool, they take um, all throughout the year we pay sanctioning fees to the into the BDC, and. They take a percentage of those sanctioning fees and they put it into the national pot. So each division gets an added payout. So not only are you going to look at the national, the national championship, you also get a chance to go what we call added money. And that added money is given back to the members because 
we earned it. We, we put into the pot throughout the year of every entry that we did, it went into the pot. So it's pretty cool what the National Bird Dog Circuit does there. And then besides that, of just like we talked about, I mean, it's unbelievable. You can't make one mistake nationals week and you're going to get your ass handed to you. I mean, I found out just a couple missed shots. I'm like living on a program. Why was I even living on a hope and prayer? I'm at the national chest. I got my ass handed to me when I freaking messed up. There's no, there's no room for, for any errors. So, I mean, this is your first nationals. Doc. What did you feel as you were pulling into scattered acres and how were you feeling for the week as you were getting started being at your first one? It was actually a little bit intimidating at first. You never, I've never seen that many people at a, a national bird dog circuit. Like you said, everybody, everybody plays for nationals and pulling in there, campers everywhere. Everybody's in there. When we got there uh, in the mornings, place is packed full since everybody can only run uh, one dog per division once. So you see a lot more people come there, and it was really cool. They did a lot of really cool things. I was really excited. Uh, I always want. I always heard you talk about nationals. You've always been very successful at nationals, especially at Winnie's last nationals with Winnie and Mike, and then Cowboy taking second. I was just really excited. I couldn't wait to get down there because I was down there for the BDC Open. Uh, yeah, BDC Open mm -hmm. in February. So I couldn't wait to get back and freaking hit her up in the prairie field. It's practically like prairie fields out there with rolling yeah. ter terraces in the field. Just beautiful, awesome yeah, cover. This is unbelievable. Just nothing like it. Yeah, I was really excited. Yeah, when you, it's exciting to to get there in anticipation, like you talk about the people, and then you start you start hanging out, and then you start, and then national starts building um, day by day. So it kind of starts Sunday with what's called a warm up or pre nationals. I never run warm up or pre nationals. It's been a tradition of mine not to run it, um, and I have a little. We have little superstitions about it, and the superstition is that the pre nationals winner never wins the nationals. And they never had it and it held true again this year. So it's kind of funny that we use that. But the reality of it is, is I like to get there early. I like to settle in. I like to get my dogs used to the train. I like to get them used to the weather inclination. And I like to just get in and relax because I'm usually traveling from so far. The, the dogs are coming from usually up here. You know, this year I'm in Louisiana training as the last podcast had me leaving going to Louisiana. And I'm down doing hunt test training with none of my personal dogs this year, which is very rare for me. I usually take a few personal dogs with me down south they were having fun with me up here yeah tournament they're having hunting. fun up here tournament hunting with alec he's playing the packer land freaking when we can talk about that too we got to talk about that with you and chaos on that and and he, patriot and patriot and uh so why don't we just diverge into that while i was gone in the south here before we get into bdc nationals alec he's going to all these local packer we have a in wisconsin we have this really cool thing at north oak hunt club steve and joy dabler run it and, they, and it's called the packland upland bird dog series and it's, it's a Wisconsin kind of local event. It's not BDC sanctioned or nothing. It's its own club event. But all of us BDC guys, a lot of us go there because it's a, it's a warm-up. It keeps us in tune all season. And they have their own dog, their own club dog of the year. So Alex having fun. I'm down there in the swamp of Louisiana training. And, and I'm texting with, yeah, him. With, with, with Mike. I just ripped one with yeah, Patriot. I just ripped one with Chaos. I just ripped one with Patriot. And I was, want it with Mike. <laughs> I want it with Mike and... And so he's taking my dogs going bird dogging on the weekends, and I'm down there like, what in the heck, man? So, uh, you know, this year just happened to rain a lot in the south, so everything's so muddy. So when you're dealing with mud every day, it's long days. But anyway, it was fun to hear Alec. And what Alec ended up doing in the Packland series is that you run five tournaments, you take your best three scores out of five, out of five, and he ended up cinching it out in front with his own dog, Chaos, this year. So congratulations Thank on that, you. Alec. And Patriot not and, far and behind. Pa and a Patriot not behind so was number two in the dog of the year. Well, those were the two dogs he ran this year. Then Mike, number three on the other on the pointing side, he was messing around with Mike, and he ran Candace a little bit and had fun. And, and it builds. It's a really good uh, starting organization. I think people who are just starting a sport going to the Packerland Upland Bird Dog Series is a big deal. Such a good place. Such uh, a great community place. like there. Yeah. You feel so welcome. Nobody's <coughs> judging you. Right. You feel so welcome. It's just... We... we I go there to usually run my younger dogs because I'm not going to run too many of my younger. I want to see what my young and my rookies are going to start doing. And so I take usually my rookies there to start getting experience um, and then see if they're going to make the cut for me to eventually be at my national caliber when I'm running all the super majors at the BDC. And so he had Patriot. I said, take Patriot. I'll see if Patriot's going to start making a cut. And I think it's it, kind of fun to stop and talk about chaos at Patriot for a second. Chaos is becoming Alex you know, first tournament dog now that he's trained himself, that he's did the wing master's way, being mentored by me, which is built in him being a trainer here now, an apprentice trainer, and moving into a trainer role at my facility uh, at the Blast Wing Shooting Centers in, a, in the wing master's headquarters here. And 
And now it's fun to see him that. So then Patriot is my up and coming stud. So, you know, Journey was my, as we talked about in the first three episodes, Journey was my staple stud. He was my first Fox Red stud that I built around him. Winnie was my first girl, my foundation female, but Journey was my foundation stud. Well, as Journey got going, I started figuring out that, well, what am I going to do for all these females that Journey's breeding? What are they going to, what am I going to do when people call me and say, who am I supposed to breed my Journey female to? So in that case, I started shopping and I got Cowboy. Well, I got to hit the jackpot twice and I got Cowboy and he was just as good as Journey and he's got his own reputation of being a pointing lab and doing well in the BDC and well in hunt tests and everything like that. And now Cowboy to Journey combinations are just throwing these rock star puppies that we're going to talk about later in this podcast to some of the winning dogs that now end up being Journey Cowboy, um, Journey Females bred to Cowboy. And so in Journey's impact on a BDC is just amazing right now and even on the Packland, but... And so then I'm built, I'm like, okay, now what am I going to do? You know, we're talking about the breeding and the genetics of what I had in the first three episodes. So if you haven't listened to Wingmasters yet, it'll catch you up because we're kind of flowing a little bit of what we talked about in the last three episodes. And so I'm like, I got to build my next stud that's completely away from Journey and completely away from Cowboy. So these females like a Journey and Cowboy in the same pattern can be bred to another stud. And that's a uh, Patriot. And... He's becoming a hell of a tournament dog. He's that's becoming all. a hell of a tournament dog as long as he's ran by Alec. <laughs> For a while, I couldn't sync up with this summit. So I kept telling Alec, oh, man, he might be on a chop block. I might have to sell him. And then in the meanwhile, I kept two out of this pairing. I took a I, – and I might have mentioned this before, but I'm just going to say this real quick. I took one of my best females, Lucy, and I AI'd her to a male that was passed away. And I kept a female from a future breeding program that I call Reason that you'll hear me talk about, we'll hear us talk about the podcast today. And she's kind of like my modern day Winnie. She's my modern Fox Day Winnie. I mean, she's my best oh. girl. I love the hell out of her. I think she's my be- one of my best dogs that I have and my up and comer in my kennel right now. And then Patriot's her brother. And Patriot, so I kept two out of there. So I'd have an up and coming future stud and I'd have an upcoming future breeding female. And Patriot and Reason are really showing. Well, every time Patriot goes with Alec, he's ripping them. In last November. year, last yeah, year. Yeah, last year. And then... Finally, this fall, um, earlier this year at in, in the Players' Championship of the Super Major of the BDC, I uh, I placed Patriots second in the puppy uh, and just lost by two seconds. And then I I uh, did well with him at Nationals, which we'll talk about too. So I've been really proud of him uh, on where he's shown up. And him and I are finally syncing up as a team too. But it was fun. I'm down south in Louisiana <laughs> just training my butt off. And Alex up here having fun with all my personal dogs and keep him in shape. But I thank you for... And I told Alec when we got yeah. down there, he comes rolling in. He starts letting the dogs out. I said to my So let me see those dogs. I said, let me see those dogs. Let me see if you're even going to get paid after these last six months because <laughs> they better be in shape and you just not sitting at home freaking partying at my house thinking that you're <laughs> thinking that. Bring them a bunch <laughs> yeah, of fat yeah, dogs. Bring a bunch of fat dogs that ain't ready for nationals. We have, I have a national program that starts about eight weeks before nationals that I, which involves a lot of conditioning and bird work and running lines and, and, um, and special nutrition. And I have my own process in which I, I get a dog ready for match, my own nationals procedure. So I taught it to Alec. I said, you do this exact stuff. You do these exact procedures to have my ready for, uh, dogs ready for nationals. And, uh, he, Alec didn't get, get paid. Cause I'm like, Hey, I'm pretty happy here. <laughs> we did. So then Sunday when we start nationals, we just get the guy and we get birds and we train. And uh, I started that day off, and we were training, and we were kicking the dogs. And I told Alec, ooh, you got these dogs rocking right where I need to be. I'm real excited for the week. As long as I can hold myself together, I know the dogs are not going to be – it's not going to be a dog issue. So that's uh, that's fun. I want to explain – and if I miss one, let me know, okay? Some terminology so you can follow along with me, right? So let me explain to you – like I just want to take like – a couple minutes here so that when I'm talking, I don't have to keep doing the definition of what I'm talking about. Terminology number one is dog of the years. All right. There is a main dog of the year event flusher and main dog of the year event pointer. You got to be the top 12 in the nation. Six of qual point dogs, six of champion point dogs. Qual point top six dogs is the top six dogs for the amount of dogs they beat. You get a point per dog you beat throughout the year, all right? Champion point dogs are the dogs of your top placements, throughout five placements throughout the year of how you earn points. Each tournament throughout the year has different amount of points available based on how big the tournament is. 
So a lot of times when Alec and I hit the road, we're going to specific tournaments for more points or higher points than just some small one because we want to go play for bigger points, which usually brings the bigger players there, which we're usually going to have tougher competition, but that's what we like. All right. So they'll take the top six champion point dogs, the top six qual point dogs, and those go into the dog of the year runoff. All right, 12 dogs go to nationals. When we get to nationals for the main event, for the main dog of the year event, you have to run in one singles run, which we call top gun. So when you hear me say top gun, that means running singles. I go run a dog singly by myself in a field and I get a time. Then I have to go over to a field with a partner that I choose to run with, which this year for Cowboy, it was, it was actually Alec. Alec and I ran Cowboy together. And we have to run a doubles run together. Okay, now that singles run and that doubles run got to get put together to see who has the best two times to see who the dog of the year champion is out of 12 teams. All right. And that is how you get your dog of the year. Well, Alec and I, we totally, oh. we totally got pump, pumped up. I don't and know we, what we, we, we were so we don't know what we're the- thinking about. We pushed Cowboy way too hard and too fast. And. Well, we we shanked the gosh thing. Uh, the when did a bird from 50 yards in the yeah, middle? Yeah, he ended oh, up boy. finding the middle bird first and coming back. And we walked out of there. I'm like, yeah, there's no way. There's no way in hell that this is going to work out. And so when we were done, and we knew that one of the toughest dogs in the country was in there. And, it, and it's interesting because you, you get to the top 12, and you could be the leading dog. The leading dog this year was a dog named Pyro and by Tony Peterson. He had the most points of the year going into nationals. But again, he's got to play against the top 12 dogs. Well, Tony ends up with, uh, who was his partner? Uh, J- Justin? I think Justin. Was, oh, yeah, I think it was Bernie for Bernie doubles. Was it? it was, it was Bur- because remember how, because Justin and Craig ran together? I can't remember. It don't ah, matter. whatever. Don't matter. Okay, Tony had his partner. They ripped I believe one. it was Bernie. Yeah, they ripped one. And uh, no, Timmy had Bernie. So I think oh, it then was, it was Justin. So it was Justin Hoffman. So Justin Hoffman's with Tony and... And they rip one with Pyro, and then Tony goes and closes the door in the singles, and he ends up I think up he just, beat everybody he by beat five, everybody. six minutes. Yeah, by like a mile. I mean, nobody was even close to Pyro, which was kind of justified because Pyro had one of the most phenomenal um, runs of the year. Um, as long as I'm on this with Pyro, and I'll just go with this here, we, there's also another series that runs that we call the Contender Series, and you take your points from the year, and you accumulate your points to... The nationals, what you run in the divisions at nationals. For both champion and qual. For both champion and qual to see if you're the contender series champion. Well, Tony had such a lead with Pyro coming from the yearly points that he basically won it before he even got there. For champion points. For champion points. And then he ended up winning the competition for qual points. So he ended up taking both contender series high point dogs and ended up winning dual jackets and became the dual champion. And the first time that that word's ever been at it. So that was wild. So for him, so and the best part is we're, we're graced in the presence of the 2019 BDC uh, flusher of the year right now, Journey. And yep. Pyro's out of Journey. Yeah, Pyro's out of Journey and a Winnie uh, daughter. So it's cool. Pays homage back to them. And uh, Journey won it in 2019, and now in 20, well, it's actually 23, but we did it in 24. Pyro wins it. So that was great. Now, then if we're the pointing side of it, it was Mike. I had Mike. And it was Tim Samuelstead and I were my partner. And Tim Samuelstead is my partner throughout the year, his doubles partner. We didn't run together in flushing because his own dog was in the flushing. So then we had to pick different partners. And that's why I had Alec. And then we ran Mike in the doubles pointing. And I ran the singles first. I came on and told Timmy, I said, it's a decent run, but it's beatable. We're going to have to make it up in the doubles. And Timmy and I had the most perfect plan. We shaved it off. Him and I were fi- high five and we were done. I said, Frickin' A, Timmy, thanks, man. I, I appreciate the hell you because if we have a chance, we just did it by shaving off time in the doubles. And when the results came out, right here it is. If you're listening in your truck, I'm holding up the trophy. Mike is also the dog of the year, was this year's BDC Nationals dog of the year for the, for the, for the pointing side. And how you, how you said you wanted to shave off time, I think it's important to elaborate that when you go to Nationals, you're playing against all of the best players and the best dogs in the country so you leave any time on the table somebody is going to snatch it up and make you pay for it right 99 percent of the time they, they if you leave one mistake oh, on the board somebody's gonna pick it up and not make that mistake 
Oh, that's hundred percent true. So that's why when you when you had when you lost when you say you know I left thirty seconds on the table and usually it's you don't want to leave it to Bernie. Right. You had to go shave off time, which you did. Right. Yeah, that's somebody's gonna pick up the slack somewhere when you got that many right. good players and that many good dogs. Right. I think it was Bernie and then it was Travis Wells, I think, or, or Mark Moyle and and yeah, I mean that's exactly it. So when I came out, I knew that. My singles, I'm like, that was good, but I left about 45 seconds on the table of the way the wind was in that field, and I just felt that in my own head. Come on, Timmy. When me and Timmy went and smoked it with Mike, and Mike was on fire. So justifiably, Mike came into the to the Nationals to dog it here as the number one pointer in points. Pyro came in as the number one pointer in points. Tony Peterson's a great friend of mine. He lives on the road. They train with us, Alec and I, each day. And so it's kind of fitting that Pyro wins it, and Mike win it because they both had led it the whole year anyway. Because in the olden days, like, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, whoever had the most points was automatically crowned Dog and Puppy of the Year, correct? Yeah, Dog of the Year, yeah. They, they, there was no runoff like this. There was no runoff in, in, in years. I think they changed that about seven years ago, the BDC did. That way, people could fight for a spot, and then it made it a little more challenging instead of just being to the points. And, yeah, so, so that's how Monday start off. Okay, then... I want to understand that, and I just jumped on that. So we're talking about terminology. So we got the dog of the year out of the way because Monday, Sunday was pre-nationals. Monday is all our dog of the year runoff. So I'm talking about the main dog of the year, which was pointing, the main dog of the year of flushing. Mike won it, which we're super proud of. The dog of the year champion here, which is Mike. Magic Mike. Magic Mike. And then we had a uh, little pie roll or, or roll. And wait, wait roll. Tony, Tony talks. What's, come on, roll. Let's do this. So <laughs> Light him up. Yeah, just like when Tony, yeah, just like when Tony <laughs> takes off from like, light him up. That's great. So, yeah, we love it. So, have fun. So, and then going to puppy of the and year. And then you go to puppy of the year. And puppy of the year is your top six champion point puppies. Now, Anything that puppy runs in, that puppy can run in three divisions. And uh, when and let me explain something. A puppy is a dog under two before the before January first. So there is puppies because of their birth dates that they actually get three seasons. All right, if they have like a uh, a January fifth birth date all the way till April fifth oh birth date. Yeah, so then he can actually run three seasons. All right, because you just got to be under two years old before the year starts. So that's that now. A puppy is that. A dog under two years old doing that. Whatever he's doing. And then, if he runs doubles, if he runs in the Top Gun Open Division, if he runs in a puppy division, every point he accumulates goes to puppy. Also to the other divisions, but it, but it goes to puppy. So, whatever that dog runs in, he's technically a puppy. So, any point he accumulates amongst any divisions, they all go to his puppy points. Okay? So, that's important to know. So puppy only goes the top six champion point. There is no call point in the puppy. So, and that's pointer and and flusher. Well, there was six. I had reason. Um, and there were six of them. And uh, some other friends, uh, Craig Anderson, who's been rocking with Penny, had Penny. Justin Hoffman, who's been rocking with Trixie, had Trixie. Tim Samuelstead had Storm. Um, what was the other one? Tony Peterson. Tony with Peterson Kai. had Kai. So well, the funny part about it is a lot of our, my friends that we all bang up on each other training, and then here we are at the national championship bang up each other. And I think it was, I think it was Jeff Tryon and Jury. Or maybe I believe was, so. I believe so. And then, so all six ran off. Well, then Tim Samuelson ended up winning it with his dog Storm. I mean, I had uh, who's that out of? And Storm is out of Journey. <laughs> we're gonna keep talking about the the breeding program here, and you're gonna think at times we're gonna do a little disclaimer here. You're gonna think at times that I'm bragging. No, I'm just proud of the genetics of which are. Journey's impact on the BDC is something to be phenomenal. So we're going to keep mentioning it. And especially dear to my heart right now because Journey, Journey got an in, injury, you know, uh, well, shit, just over a year ago now that ended his career early. So it sucks for me that Journey can't be in when he actually had two years left of his career. He was out. So that was puppy of the year. Okay. Then, and that's both sides. And well, I think Maverick won it with Drew. Drew. So Maverick Birkenholtz won it with Drew. And then... Uh, and then you got your ladies pointing dogs of the year. Now they earn qual points. So then the ladies earn qual points. So they do it a little bit differently. It's not based on the dog. The ladies got to accumulate points based on how many dogs they run. They got to take the dog they earn the most qual points with and they got to run it at the ladies player of the year runoff. That's how they do it in the ladies. It's a, uh, their own way that they wanted it. And so in that case, they they take the top six 
qual points and a top six on each side. And when it came down, and it was uh, Jenny, uh, how do I say Amy? I think Amy. it's Amy. Jenny Amy. Jenny Amy. It's spelled weird. That's why I always want to spell it. Jenny Amy won it with her dog Jury, I believe. And then, and then uh, Paula Wallace won it with her dog Dolce on the pointing side. So, so this all happens on Monday, the first day. Every time. Every, every year. time. Right. So nationals hasn't per se even started yet. What happens is is Monday finishes off the previous year. So when we get there on Monday, we're battling from what we did the previous year. That's the so let's just exit right there and go. So now let's talk about divisions and what dogs can run. All right. So what I want to say this so I can give you a little terminology and some of the divisions I'm going to mention, although they don't pertain to our podcast today. All right. So now the rest of the week. We're going to have doubles flushing, which is two people, one dog, and we're going to have pointing, and we're going to have pointing doubles. Then we're going to have puppy, puppy flushing, puppy pointing, right? And that's one dog, one man doing a puppy. Under okay. two years old. Under two years old. So then you're going to have a puppy national champion, and you're going to have a doubles national champion on both side defense. Okay, then you're going to have a singles, which is called Top Gun. So when you hear me say Top Gun. That's the singles national champion. It's it's the the most prestigious national champion is the singles flushing national champion and the singles singles pointing national champion. All right, so you got that on each side. Then we got what's called a masters flushing and a masters pointing. That is anybody over the age of fifty can is the only people that can run in there. All right. Then we have a ladies national champion flushing and a ladies national champion pointing. All right. That's what what we call her is the ladies competing on each side. Then we have what's called a hunter flushing national champion and a hunter uh, pointing. And the easiest way to describe them is amateur. It's an amateur hunting flusher and amateur uh, pointer. All right. So we have different divisions of nationals. Your number one most prestigious award is the Top Gun Singles Flushing and Pointing National Champion. The rest of them are kind of wrapped around that prestigious award. So what I'm talking... And we're going on about the week here and about what happened on our week. And we're talking about the BDC Nationals. That'll give you some idea of the terminology. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Al? I think you said that perfectly. Okay. So Monday was the end to our previous season. I think you guys all got what I just said there. Dog deer, Mike won it, Pyro won it. We're on to it, right? Okay, Tuesday starts double pointing prelims. We had Mike and doubles pointing. We had Candace and, and we just couldn't get a fast enough run to put Mike or Candace into the doubles. I think uh, Mike... Barely got beat out, and I think Candace was actually even closer to getting in. Yeah, she barely. She barely got beat up, but Mike got beat up uh, uh, rather just, you know, we made a zigged instead of zagged, and we just didn't have good runs. With the, and this was Tuesday now, so this is Tuesday at Nationals. Okay, while we're running doubles pointing, there's also puppy flushing prelims. Puppy flushing prelims and pointing, but Tuesday is puppy flushing only, is the only division at Nationals that you can enter a dog twice. So we get four entries, all right? But we can take two dogs and enter them twice in the puppy only. So any other division, one and, dog gets one run per division. Yeah, one. so one dog gets one run per division. So as long as I'm on this subject, when we run singles open, top gun, okay? When we run the singles top gun, all right, we get four entries, but the dog can only enter once. So if, like, for me, who has one dog, if I'm not running anybody else's dog, I only get one run with chaos. It only gets one run, all right? Then, in doubles, you can actually run up to six times if you pair it correctly. But again, the dog can only run once. So in my in my doubles, for what we do, I always pair up with Tim Samuelson because we've been at it for 15 years, and he's my best friend in sport, and we've been doing it forever. And so he always takes three of his best dogs, and I take three of my best, and we even we equal that out. But on Tuesday was doubles pointing and puppy flushing prelims, which we could enter. So, uh, like I said, Candace and, uh, and Mike were, could only be entered once, and they both got beat out in the brackets. So I want you guys to understand the bracket play for a minute on terminology. So when you hear me talk about brackets, because we're going to be talking about brackets a lot. At this year's Nationals, we got put in four dog brackets. There's multiple reasons why this happens, but let's do the main reason. The main reason why the BDC believes in f bracket system is because then all four of those dogs play in the same scenting conditions in the same wind. Because if somebody's playing at 9 o'clock in the morning and it's cool and it's 40 degrees, and then another group of dogs are playing in the afternoon and it went up to 75 degrees and it's dry and dusty, it's not the same conditions. 
So you get bracketed in in four, and in doubles, you got to be one out of four. You got to be the winner out of the four. And in a puppy, you also got to be one out of four in a prelims. So I had Reason twice and Patriot twice, which we talked about earlier. And Reason's first run, I mean, it was the first run of day. And Alec and I actually ended up in the same bracket. And, and that bracket got crazy because we all pretty much kind of had the same set. We all, okay. three people out of that bracket, you and me included, had the same exact plant, which was one of the worst plants. One yeah. gave burden, it was the far side. Yeah, and so, see, there's plant, another terminology is there's plant cards. And you start learning as a player how to eliminate where you're going to go on a thing based on what you th- plant card you think you got. It's not just going in and hunting field. You strategize. It's not, yeah, it's not just going hunting field. You have to strategize by eliminating where birds can be in your head. So it's almost like it's a chess match with these cards. And you're, you're checkmating where your birds can be based on how the cards are laid out as you're on the field. So it's actually more like playing chess in the field with a bird dog. That's our best way to describe it without us explaining the plant cards. So you draw a plant card. And we happened to get the plant card. And reason- 20 out of 28, yeah, all, three 20, of us yeah, got wild. one out of 28 yeah. all the same. You know, there might have been something goofy going on there. But anyway, <laughs> so we ended up getting it. Well, none of us got to see. I was the first run day, so I don't get to see the field. Alec was running somewhere else. He didn't get to see, see the field. And the, and the second guy was actually what did get a chance to watch my run now I think about it. Okay, and then I think the fourth guy. So we're looped at it. Well, anyway, when the when that bracket got done, I had only we were all what within within fifteen seconds. Within fifteen seconds, and you took her home, and I took it home with reason with the first run of the day. I that's always nerve wracking watching the clock for three other runs. Says, and when I watched, I saw like, Mike. Oh my God. I saw I saw Mike up there watching uh, by his truck, and I said, oh, I bet he had a good one if he's watching. Yep. So I was watching, and reason got through. So I was I was very proud of. Her. And then Patriot with his first run. It was just a nice smooth. I believe it was like a five minute flat. And uh when I came out of there, I'm like, I think that's sitting pretty good. And then and then uh later on I found out when I went around to the gallery, they're like, Yeah, you got that one too. So that was awesome. But then my second reason run, I really the the week kind of blurs. I really don't want know what happened with it. I either walked around a bird or I missed a shot. And my second Patriot one, I think I one of the two. I walked around a bird or missed. I just didn't put it together, whatever it was. So when my day was done, I I had Patriot and Reason both in the Puppy Finals. Now, that's Tuesday, and you don't run the Puppy Finals until Saturday. So so you make it in on Tuesday, but you won't be running the Finals until Saturday. So I was happy that I had two puppies going into Saturday. Yeah, then, my, my and, boss beat me out on my first one, so I had to make it happen I don't on the feel second bad one. About it. And we were talking about <laughs> leaving time on the table. My puppy run, I, I left... I, I didn't have the best set. I had to cover a lot of zones, and I tried tried to make the best, and I, I felt like I ran a good run for the what I had with right. covering all the zones, but I knew somebody could get me, but it turns out it just happened to be that I got them through and everybody this else kind of struggled. Yep. Run, right? Yeah, this was Chaos' second run. Yeah. So in that bracket, I won that bracket. Um, I was fortunate yeah. enough to. Yeah. And I like you, sometimes when you, you get when you have to cover zones or you're in bad conditions, you make you don't complain. You make what's best of it. You do yeah. your best, and that's why whatever we the bracket system. Exactly, you do you do what you can, and that's all yeah. you can do. Yeah. Sometimes. Like I walked away, even though I didn't have the best time. Like I mean, I was nail biting my nails, hoping like you said, you're watching that clock. That clock don't go any slower. Right. Uh, but I felt good about what I did. And I didn't feel like I wasted a lot of time anywhere. I I did the best with what I could do. You know. And that's why the brackets are there. You'll see some brackets that are whipping through, and they're all within seconds. And then you'll see some brackets where there's some big separation. We'll be able to explain that on another on one, the upcoming days. Yeah, you know that's a that's what we'll be able to explain a little bit more. So so that that's our, so that was our Tuesday was running our our puppies. When the day ended, there was 18 puppies that went to the finals because I believe we started with 60 some, which is an awesome puppy. So oh yeah, there was like 60 some puppies at the nationals, and I think the BDC took 18. Um, and when we were done, 16 of the 18 were... It would have been 64 because it was 18, so yeah. 64. Or, or 72, actually, maybe. Yeah, 72. 72. So, so, we're 16 of the 18 puppies, I think, is what we accounted. We're all from my breeding. It was a wild ride. And so, I, I just... Uh, uh, it's just such a proud moment to think about that. And probably out of them 16, I probably trained 12... Me and you and I probably trained 12 or 14 of them. Yeah, there's probably only two of them that Dang we didn't close. train, or maybe just one that we didn't even train actually to think about it. And I think um, it's important to note that you're gonna hear Mike and I talk a lot about 
how well his genetics did at this tournament. But and like he said, it's not to brag, but you worked for the past 15 years to build this and right. to allow people to do this, to right. have the best tournament dog, the best duck dog, the best upland if you're a wild bird hunter. Right. You you devoted your life to building the best genetics you possibly could right. and to c- continue furthering that and bettering it. Yeah, thanks for saying that. Because what I'm saying, guys, I'm just saying it from a prideful standpoint of of what I've built in. A lot of these guys that are tournaments would have never even been introduced to tournaments had they not met me. And I'm not saying they went to found it on their own, but a lot of times, as long as we're on this subject, people are like, oh, you're part of Team Blast? They'll say to my buddies, well, no, they're, they, they, we became friends through bird dogs. They saw my passion for tournament hunting. They wanted to try it themselves, and then they found out that I was their sport. This is what we do. When we say we're bird dogging, this is what we do. This is what, this is what we talk about. All summer, we're talking about bird dogging and building our next... Like, you're going to be building Karma this year. And I'm going to be building my little Connor and Kiss this year. All right? And and all year, we talk about the dogs are building, how we get the dogs in shape, how we can shoot better. We're practicing shotgunning. And then when tournament season hits, we're like, oh, it's time to Game rock. on. Game on. And we're putting thousands of miles on the truck, and we're going all over the country. We don't, we don't play any other sports. We don't play golf. We don't play softball. We don't go... We don't go boating in the summer. We don't do none of that. And like you said, part being part of the team, it's not even being part of the team in terms of like I mean, for me and yeah. you, for me it is like yeah. in terms of because I support you so much. Right. But when I show up wearing the new swag and yeah. wing masters, it's because I believe in the lifestyle right. and I want to represent. It's not because it's not because I want to be part of some team. It's because I want to live this lifestyle and right. I believe it. I want to represent the best of the best, and that's why I wear this. I believe in Sidka, you know. That's just yeah. how it is. I believe in wing match. I wouldn't wear something if I didn't believe in it just to feel like I'm part of something. Yeah, that's awesome. That's why you see so many people wearing the blast. I always, it's always funny when we go, going back to the pack line, always see people wearing the blast wing shooting kennels. It's because they believe in your genetics or they've had a dog trained by you and stuff right. like that. They believe in my genetics and believe in my, uh, um, like you said, my training program. And I, and I appreciate that. And that's, as long as we're on that subject for two seconds here, let's stop and talk about that's That's what wing masters are about. If you buy a hat for me or something, it wouldn't even matter if you owned your own kennel. Because Wingmasters is a lifestyle brand. Wingmasters doesn't just... I have the Blast Wing Shooting Kennels out there, which is my my dog training and my facility here. Wingmasters is the culture in which we all love uh, doing whatever we do with our bird dogs. I mean, you think about what, what I do over there out in the summer. I train rock and gun dogs for high-level duck dog people, duck hunting people, for high-level upland hunters and grouse and pheasant and sharp tail and everything like that in pointers and in, in the flushing and retriever side and then all summer where other people are boating and having a good time i don't even know what a normal summer is because i'm taking these dogs and putting their hunt test titles on them for their breeding purposes in the summer and i'm becoming so, a bloody mary connoisseur yeah, on the way yeah. <laughs> Alec, we're gonna we gotta start a TikTok with him. He, he still hasn't fired up this TikTok. I keep saying, would you start fire? I said everywhere. we're building one business at a time, Mike. <laughs> yeah, what bill is this? I'm like, come on, you're the bloody connoisseur here. We gotta start a TikTok because everywhere I take this guy, he's gotta try a bloody at every single bar of every city I take somewhere. He says we gotta stop there. We gotta try at least one bloody, and he's gotta have one bloody everywhere. He so he's he's the bloody. That's what we call him, the bloody connoisseur. He loves his bloodies. I think. Oh my god! I don't know how you drink those things half the time, but anyway. So yeah, so we have a good time, and it's a it's a blast. But yeah, so so look at Wingmasters as a lifestyle in the future of you guys being able to get on the website and train your own dog and learn how to shoot and play tournaments or run hunt tests and train, go hunting with your own dog. And if you've never hunted before, that's what it's about. Like, you know, I thought it was pretty cool this morning when Chad Brunell stopped by and we were training Moose and his dogs one way away from his master title, and there's some people here picking up their dogs that we were showing them today that were done in training. And he's like, you know, I got with Mike and I never bird hunted a day in my life. Now I'm running tournaments, going bird hunting every weekend, run, learning how to handle my dog. And he came from a military background. All he's ever known is how to be on missions with a gun in his hand for the military. He never hunted. So it's so cool to see somebody come, get a dog, learn how to do it, uh, learn to be mentored. I didn't, I had mentors in the sport that were, that I learned from vicariously by being around them. I didn't have a mentor like I've mentored you guys, where I can make you cut through a lot of the stuff on how fast you've become so good and how fast. What was going. that famous quote? Oh yeah, that okay, you would tell so, me. So in martial arts, I was, uh, excuse me, I was an instructor in Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do. The number one quote I had it on my walls in my martial arts school was called, 
and it's talking about gathering information, right? Absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, and add what is specifically your own. That's a number one Bruce Lee quote. And I've lived my whole life that way because I didn't go to college like you or nothing. I had a business coach I uh, that, that helped me a little bit. Otherwise, it was, okay, I need to learn about business and numbers and budgets and, and marketing and, and all that stuff. Well, I just read every book I could find on that subject, took little bits and pieces of what was what was useful to me, rejected what was useless, and then specifically my own ideas of how that could work, right? And that's, it was the same way of dog training. I didn't get to stand, like I mentioned in our previous podcast, if you haven't listened to our previous podcast, go back to episode one through three, and we talk about the creating of wingmasters and stuff. And I mentioned in there about, I didn't get to tr- train with a pro trainer for 10 years and then gleam off of his knowledge and then go and, start my business off is now to say, you know what? I got your knowledge now. I'm going to go start my own business. No, I had to go through the lumps of learning how to train a dog. That didn't work on this dog distant. And again, it came back to let's accept those techniques. All right. Okay. Absorb what is useful. Reject. You know, that don't work for me over here. I've done it on multiple dogs and that don't work. That's got to go on a shelf. And then I think that if I did this with this, it might be a little better. And that was added with specifically my own. And that's how I developed the wingmaster training methods. You know, of course, they're the blast wing shooting methods first. And, and then that's how I did. And then I put the genetics with the training methods. And then I put the performance by going and making master hunters and making tournament hunters. And that was my life. I, I am such a systematic. I find I am so intrigued by systems. Like you can talk to me about anything oh, systems. Yeah. I, I mean, what's the system of building a car? What's the, what's the system of building a house? What's the system of... From ground one to the end. Well, let me just tell you. Process. Let me tell you the system of isolating DNA through <laughs> isozymes and stuff like that. <laughs> Alex, I'm about to be a graduate friend and be a UW Stevens pointer here in about a month, but we don't have time to talk about that. It's gonna be all night. And everybody's gonna. You don't want to talk about yeah, biochemistry? Yeah, maybe? everybody's gonna take a freaking sneeze pill. <laughs> everybody wants to talk about bird dogging. But anyway, so anyway, I'm intrigued by that. So we diverged a little bit here. I think it was important though. But it's important to diverge and talk about it and talk about how proud for we are. And, and so hang with me, Wingmasters. And you guys as fans, we're talking to you guys as fans too, and I'm promoting the sport. I've been probably one of the most advocates of tournament hunting. Like this is the first podcast that talks about tournament hunting. Yeah, we talk about like championships that Winnie's won or Jeremy's yeah, won, but never about tournaments. About tournament hunting. We're going to have tournament hunters on this podcast. That's, I can't wait. We also just did a rocking first guest podcast that we can't say anything about. We traveled down south. We got five hours. Just a legend. Just a legend. And this is going to be amazing. So we're going to release that sometime in May before my hunt test seminar. And he's never been on a podcast. he's never been on a podcast. So it's going to be rocking. But then the goal is to start getting these old school tournament hunters on here so you can hear about players. Because the closest thing I can relate this sport to is rodeo. And, you know, when you think about Kai Hamilton and you think about J.B. Mooney and you think about, um, you know, some of the other like Fallon Taylor and some of the uh, uh, and uh, Kinsley, Haley Kinsley and stuff that's uh, barrel racers and some of these top level um, rodeo people. It's that's what we are in the bird dog in world. So in the ranch lifestyle, you got rodeo in the in the bird dog lifestyle. You got tournament hunting. And that's what my. My goal is, that's what I'm advocating for. I want people to, to respect our sport. So something that the BDC is doing really cool that they just informed me on, because they're like, Mike, you might want to start telling your people about this, is the BDC told me, they're like, hey, this new website is going to have player profiles, just like Bass Pro Fishing, just like the Bass Masters. It's going to have uh, player profiles. It's going to have the dogs updated points. It's going to have all the dogs wins. So you're literally going to be able to go on and look up Al Kisley, know how many championships he's won, know what dogs he's run, look them up see what type of players and then Alec can literally put in a little profile about himself of of what he is as a BDC player right on the website and you'll be able to go start following the stats of BDC players I mean How that, cool is, is that? that is this badass that's never been done in tournament on and it's same as for you know tournament fishing they do it that so it's kind of following that lines in rodeo so it's really cool with what the BDC oh, is about I can't it. wait yeah for that. it's gonna be and it's gonna be out I think sometime this summer they're saying because the BDC is building a brand new website so it's a it's a rocking thing. So anyway, we just diverged off that top. Carry on. So let's move. So oh, leaving off of Tuesday. Yeah, leaving off of Tuesday. So 
Now Wednesday is doubles flushy, right? And then it's pointer, it's pointing puppy. I ran Candace twice in the pointing puppy. She's my new girl that we talk about. Wait, she, didn't Timmy run her once? Oh, that's true. Timmy Did, ran her. Yes, Timmy ran her once, and I because he got her, her in the finals. Because Timmy got Candace in the in the finals. Thanks for saying that. And she got in the finals, and so she went to Saturday, and this was Wednesday now. And then I ran her once, and I didn't get her through. She ran a good run, just wasn't fast enough. And then, then we had doubles, and Tim had his three, and I had my three, so we had our six. And at the end of the day, the dogs that we got pushed through was my reason and my cowboy. We got through, and that was going into into Saturday now. So it was um, so that was exciting of a day. And then you had chaos in the doubles. Yep, right? with Tony Peterson, he was my partner. And then we also got him through with a ripper. And then I go back to see it. I'm like, oh, I wonder if anybody else had even close to it. We, we ran a 314 and won our fuel points for that field. Oh, sure enough, genetics. His own dad beat him by seven seconds. And they, they won their fuel points with a freaking 307. I'm like, that son of a gun. So Cowboy <laughs> ran a 307 and Chaos ran a 314 for that day on their each different fields. Yeah, so that was really cool to see. Yeah, two different fields. Because when you're... I think it's good to die uh, to sideline there for a second. When you are at nationals, you or you, any super major, you're in a super major, you win the field. Like if you're the fastest time in that field, you win points. And so first place gets five, second place gets three, third place gets one. So there's field points daily too throughout the week. So so it's 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 uh, kind of neat for for that going on. So yeah, it was funny because chaos won one field and and cowboy run the other field and his father son. So it's cool as heck. So um. So he had gotten them through. So that was our day of what happened on Wednesday. Now Thursday, all right, is what starts the Top Gun prelims. So this starts you because what we do is we started, I believe, at 92 entries this year is what was entered. Yeah, and, somewhere. And yeah. the first day on Thursday is only singles. So now it's Top Gun. It's only singles. So I, I had Reason, Patriot, Cowboy, and Whisper. And... Those were my four entries. And when the day settled, oh, man, I missed a shot over reason to be in no And problem. you just told me you were flat out smoked. Flat out smoking. Well, you did. You I, had like a four, four something. Yeah, and I just wanted to cry because poor girl it just was on fire for me all week. And uh, so then I, I like, I'm i like, oh, you got to be kidding me. So I, I, I whiffed a shot on her. Patriot, I think I either whiffed a shot or something just went wrong on there. Whisper, I totally read the field wrong, so I was like, oh, my God. And then Cowboy had gotten through to Thursday. And then when I went over with Mike and Candace on the pointing side, because um, pointing and flushing runs that day, all the singles, I over to Candace, and I was just a little too slow to get in on, on that one. And I went over, and I and I won my bracket with Mike in advance to, to Friday to the semifinals with Mike. And then which which dogs did you have? I on, had on starting on Thursday, which is live, pre- which is owned by Megan Matthews, and then my yeah. chaos. And I I think I just remember this. I think it was pretty cool that we live and Cowboy were in the same bracket for the in the first one of the day. So you ran first right away with Cowboy, and I think I ran third. And uh, both of them advanced, so that right. was pretty cool because they were taking. I believe they were taking. Two out of each one. They're taking two out of two four, out of four, right? Four, yeah. yeah, it was two out of 50% four. So I, I, I texted Mike right right away once I once I ran live. I said, we just got live and cowboy through, so that was cool. And I ran a really smooth run for my pre-lo- prelim run with Chaos and got him through, punched him through. So that was really exciting. Yeah. So that was that was on, on Thursday. Now, Thursday night is a really neat um, thing that goes on here. And talking about neat things, before you go into that, I think it's really important to say what happened every morning. Yeah, cool. We just before we get into yeah Thursday night. Yeah, we didn't really at the beginning. You know, there's so much anticipation at the at the BDC National. It's so exciting. But every morning this year, what the BDC did is play the nas- different versions of the national anthem. And so when you're standing there in the morning and you know every day is a new opportunity, which is so cool about the BDC Nationals. And you're standing there amongst all the best players. Point your half, doing the doing American flag, and listen to the national anthem. It makes you like rise up and be like, "Oh, I'm here with the best of the best, and we better." We and better get, get goosebumps. You get goosebumps every time. It's like, and it sure starts your morning off with a bang. So yeah, that was cool that the BDC did that this year. They did uh, they did the national anthem each morning. In the evening of the Thursday of the nationals is the banquet, and the banquet is always so special because that's when everybody gets together and dresses up nice, and the BDC owners um, address all the members and do the awards this year 
the BDC had hired, it was really cool. I mean, they hired Mike Mulvaney. And Mike Mulvaney is out from uh, Wyoming. And he was the, the marshal of the week. So a marshal is a person who keeps all the fields running. And if anything goes wrong, turns in the scorecards into Mandy Samuelstead, which is our, which is the office uh, administrative lady. And and he he takes care of all the logistics of keeping the fields running. All this, he does all the staff. He does all the run orders. He, he keeps everything moving. And he did. I mean, the BDC did an awesome job by hiring him this year. And... And Mike Mulvaney did the award ceremony. So the owners addressed them and then handed the mic over to Mike Mulvaney to do all the awards. And what we do is the Dog of the Year awards. So like we talked about, that was the night that Pyro got his Dog of the Year trophy. I got Mike's Pyro or Mike's Dog of the Year trophy right here. We had, um, they do the Puppy of the Year, which Sam, Tim Samuel said I got his Puppy Year. And Maverick Bergholz has gotten him. Jenny had gotten hers and and Paula had gotten hers what we mentioned earlier in the in the podcast here you get that then they they move and we have a meal to start it everybody has a meal to start it and then we move to kind of the really special pieces of the night a black jacket is won by winning a super major event and that's how you earn your black jacket well in this case there was two black jackets this year Jeff Tryon read his girlfriend's was Jenny Amy's and gave her her black jacket because she had won her first super major in this last season. Um, I was brought up for Craig Anderson. It was fun. You guys hear me talk about Craig Anderson a lot. And, he, and we talk about Penny a lot right now because he's hot with it, with uh, Craig Anderson and Penny. But Craig had mentored me and built his dream of being a dog trainer, being around me since he was 19 years old. He now trains his own dogs. He now, now guides at the hunt club I used to guide at. And... He worked for me in the summer. He learned a lot from me. And then he learned tournament hunt from me. So I watched Craig grow up where I met him when he was 19. And now he has a family and his two kids and and his own career. And his dream was to be a dog trainer like me. And he made it happen. And I'm so proud of him of going through. So I got to hand him his black jacket. And that was a very special moment for me because Craig's like a little brother to me. So I uh, it was great to hand him his, his black jacket. And then kind of the, the end of the night, which is a special night. It's, is they do Hall of Fame. There was two Flusher Hall of Fames that went in, in and two Pointer. This year was a Jet Jr. owned by T- Tim Cruz and Marley owned by Brian Matthews that was also owned by Dan Cathcart at one time. So they did those and put those two Flushers in. And then the Pointers was Joey, which is owned by um, Adam Van de Heer and his and uh, which is uh, AKA Shake and Bake, they call him. And then the other one was the, by Magic Storm, which was by Randy, uh, Randy and, uh, oh, why am I drawing a? Why am I drawing a name on his sons? Why am I drawing a blank on his son? Anyway, the Hilgases. Let's just say the Hilgases. I'm sorry, buddy, that for draw for forgetting your name on there. But the Hilgases <laughs> had went in, and Magic Storm had went in, and so it was cool, and and it's a special time, and we got that video footage that we yep, used to, that we, we got to get posted out now, and we'll start putting some of the stuff out for you guys to see. So that's always a special night. Then the BDC ended with a special award this year. It's pretty cool. The Garrity family, um, we called their grandma. It was really cool. And the Garrity family, grandma used to go to every event with the Garrities, and they travel. And the Garrities have been the longest supporters of the BDC, and they travel as a family. I mean, it's crazy. They got like five, six family members to play the BDC. And the the grandma had passed away earlier this year, so the BDC awarded them with a family um, lifetime honorship award to Donna Garrity this year, which we all call grandma, so it was a really cool award. So yeah, it was fun, and then everybody hangs out at the end of the night, and and uh, and that's and that's the banquet is like a special night because it's it gets there, and then we do the Player of the Year awards, which uh, was won by uh, Travis. The Player of the Year was Travis Wells, and we did the Hunter Player of the Year, which was won by Little Eddie Dalman, which we need to we need to talk to about him in here in a minute. We'll go to him in a second, and uh, and the Youth Player of the Year was Jamin Schultz, which he said he would like to give it to Eddie too because he's kind of eighteen now and he's grown and he's doing really well himself, but. So we, and the Masters Player of the Year was Brian Matthews. So we, uh, so they give away the Player of the Year awards too. So I think I skimmed, I gave that pretty good. Um, and yeah, so let's just, we'll, we'll roll there. I'm going to stop I there. because that's I, perfect. Yeah, I had a couple other things there. Okay, now, so that's Thursday night. On Friday, <clears throat> we were going into the semifinals. And by that time, I just had Cowboy. And all I had was, was Mike. And at the end of the day, like on Cowboy, on his run, 
I just didn't bring him short enough on one of the middle birds, so I didn't make it into the finals of Cowboy. And then when I went out with Mike, I ripped one with Mike. It was awesome. And I put punched Mike in. So when it came to the singles, all I had was 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 Mike. So it was the first time in, man, I don't remember how many years that I actually didn't have a flushing dog in the finals at this year's Nationals. So I'm pretty disappointed in myself on that. But but then you had, what did you have again? There? I had uh, Chaos and then live which is again owned by megan matthews and with chaos's run just had a he was having a rocket rock and run walking birds and it comes a fourth bird gets up i shoot and i see it fly away and i'm like oh no and then all i could have punched the ticket but with that missed shot and uh i didn't double tap which was an unfortunate mistake on my part and if you want to explain what double tap is yeah double tap is when you double shoot a bird you're usually only going to get in with one shot so a lot of times you'll shoot a bird and if you tickle it if you barely touch it, you'll fly and hope that the dog bails you out because then you won't you won't have that extra time. The clock jumps forward two and a half to three minutes depending on where the where your time ends up. And usually you're not gonna make it in if you yeah, got You got hopes and prayers. That's and... giving somebody a, a two and a half minute lead before they even start yeah. in a bracket. So that was pretty heartbreaking that I did that to him because you know it's just hard and we've talked about it emotions with your own dogs versus somebody else's dog right um but you know you make those detrimental mistakes at nationals and somebody's going to make up for it and somebody's going to put five birds on the ground right and usually most people are going to put five birds on the ground so with me missing that one bird i i took them out of that and i took both of us as a team out of that but then it came down to live and for when we're taking two out of five and we're talking about brackets. I actually ended up in the back with four birds. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And when I found that front middle bird, I found out that they put them really close together. So when I hit my front right gate bird, I walked her right past the front front middle gate bird. And, you know, they were both in the zones. And I, I couldn't say nothing other than it was my fault. It right. wasn't Liv's fault. It, the bird planters, the birds were there. They were, were where they were supposed to be. And it was just my fault that I didn't put her in that place. And for how close they were, I just skipped over that spot. Right. And, you know, and then I walked away. And usually I'd sit and watch the field. But uh, I said, somebody's going to beat that eight and a half or nine minute run or whatever it was. And I go back to born to my surprise. We actually punched her in. She was, um, they took two out of five. And the only two dogs in that bracket that didn't go full went to the finals. And that's where it comes into play where it's so important about the bracketing system because those other three dogs went full. You go back to the first bracket on that field in the beginning of the, uh, the day in the morning. There was three dogs, 410, 411, 412, and they took the 410 and 411, and nobody else went full right, out of the five dogs. But you only take two, so a 410 and a 411 went in while the 412 did not get in. Right, which is wild. Why that's brackets like, are so important. Yeah, that's so, impre- so important. And when we say full, that means somebody's clock ran out. So we were doing 12-minute runs, and when we were doing 12-minute runs, if you don't find your five birds before 12 minutes, you're done. And then they go and kick that bird out and, and show you where your bird is and where you missed it. So when we say they went full, so three of them runs in your bracket went full. They didn't find their birds in time. And then the only two that did did find their birds in time were the ones that went through your went bracket through. at yeah. that time of day. And that can be wind, dust, heat, whatever. And that's why the bracket system, what we explained earlier, is so, so important. important. So important in how it is. Because you go to UFTA... Yeah. I don't believe they do brackets in UFTA. You just go, whatever time you're drawn, you better be there. Yeah, and no other organization in the country does brackets. Yeah. So that's where the BDC has uh, leveled the playing field amongst the dogs and the conditions throughout the day, which is special. They So so that's the end of our Friday. And then Friday night, they Calcutta the dogs in the finals. And Such a cool experience. It's a cool, <clears throat> it's a cool experience because somebody can bid on your dog to – to want to buy your dog so that if you win it, they get the money because they split the, the pot 60-40. And so you're, how much do you believe in your dog now is what it comes down to because people know that, like, for example, Mike and, and myself have won so much, so they want to buy Mike because they know that my odds of winning is very high because I've won a lot in the finals in the past. So that if they buy me, then they can win the pot. And then they, even if they don't have a dog in the finals, they could at least buy a dog in the finals and have some some stake in the finals, even if they need. So it's kind of a cool experience on Friday nights when when it gets going and you're having fun and you're doing a cow. They actually bring an auction year in, and it's a it's a fun time and it's a BDC tradition that we that we that we auction off all the dogs on the pointing and on, on the flushing, and we also do it for the doubles. So we do it for the doubles. 
and we also do it for the single, so it's cool on that night. It's what, fun. you aren't going to tell them the prices? Yeah. <laughs> So the prices get a little bit crazy, but you know that's uh, that's just kind of part of the game. So it's fun. It's a yeah, fun it's it's there. an awesome experience. Yeah, that's an awesome. so that's what we do Friday night. Everybody sits around and bids on their dogs and gets ready for the finals. And now the day comes, and so you got to think we've been bird dogging, and some people that did the warm up nationals been bird dogging since Sunday. We've been bird dogging since Monday, and now it's Saturday. I mean, we're yep. we're six days into. Bird dog. Do you want to touch on that quick before you get into what happened on Saturday about being a marathon? Yeah. I think you should touch on that right now. This is a perfect time for that. Going into yeah. finals and having a marathon, being in a marathon for tournament hunting. Right. The Being in a marathon is because – so the easiest way to explain it is it's a mental management system. Every day is a new opportunity, but you can't carry your emotional baggage with you. So, if I have a bad Tuesday, well, Wednesday's a new day. And I need to go in there fresh. But it's like any sport. When you're running a marathon, you're wearing down physically and emotionally. You're getting tired. You're sleeping in a different bag. You're sun up to sundown bird dogging. You're taking care of the dogs. There's a player meeting every morning. You got the national anthem every morning. So, you get in this routine. Well, you start, you got to really hold yourself together. So, you know, we go into, like, athletic mental management systems at that time. And I think one of the best things that you ever told me that the previous day, since we're on Saturday right now, Friday, when I missed that shot over Chaos and then punched Liv through, Chaos was before Liv, and I had and I told you about it, and you always taught me that you have to let it go immediately. You right. cannot dwell on something like that. Are you going to have a bad run? Because when you start dwelling and saying, what could I have changed or that wasn't fair, then you're already taking yourself out of the game. You're not keeping that mental management system. Yeah, and you, you're a good point. You have to be a, a quickly. You got to forget because the problem is you'll carry in your problem to the next run, and it's not fair to your next dog. So, like, let's say I missed a shot over a reason, and and then they call me and say, "Okay, you got Patriot over on this field." On the way over, I'm still grieving reason. I'm like, man, I hope I don't miss a shot now on Patriot because I just missed over reason. And I carry that missed shot to Patriot. Now, I'm not giving him 100% of my mental management. And so each dog deserves you to be 100% present. So if you're still carrying the grieving of a dog before your next one, and let's just say you missed a shot in that in that, in that that run, which is kind of like the biggest mental... Uh, mental hiccup in a, in a player's mind is if you miss a shot and you go into the next run maybe a little weak minded it's like okay I gotta get that shot out of my head because I'm not gonna miss on this run and you have to switch your brain like right now and be like alright I'm gonna go pound I'm gonna go knock the head off every bird now I'm gonna oh, slice yeah. these sons of bitches in half now exactly and and you have to do that in, in order to bring your brain back so like whenever I'm around my friends or yeah I missed a shot or whatever on that alright snap out of it go pound them on this one you know and you got to be able to snap. And that wears on you throughout the week. Because so, you're running so because much. Because you're running so much. I mean, I've had, I had a Nationals two years ago that I'm not going to dig in. But let's just say it was the best Nationals of my life. And I had figured out that there was like 130 birds that went in, in the air. And I missed one. I shot like... 129. It wasn't that one. That wasn't that one over. Uh, oh no, that was last year with Patriot, where he was just smoking it for yeah, you. Yeah, that was that was last year. But the year that I had done it. So, so your consistency of being a shoot, a marksman, a shotgunner, and your consistency of running your dogs and being being a field manager, and then the dogs doing their work and putting that all together, that marathon gets gets to you. And you get it, to the finals and you take yourself out of the day of the finals and right. you've worked all week for it. Right, you work all week to get there and then you carry your week's baggage with you to finals. When you get to finals, you're just happy you're there. You know? So, I mean, it's in, and it's interesting because, you know, I mentor this to, to adults and I see some adults that, that, are like teenagers like they can't get over the mental management and it hurts them as players and I try to go through them and help them you know and then I think about like Eddie Dahlman you know Eddie Dahlman is got in the finals and doubles I don't think he got in finals singles and he won the Hunter Flusher this year and he's 14 years old and he was the Hunter Flusher uh, player of the year and he's been 
mentored by me through my Wingmasters program from the time he's been 11 years old. His dad and his grandpa, Bill, and his dad, Nick Dahlman, have taught him such a good safety and such a good start to being a bird hunter because they're just bird hunters and they never knew where they're getting it. And when I started training their dogs, I said, there's this thing, tournament on. Well, now their whole family's involved. Pam Dahlman judges for the BDC and she's very involved because she has a horse background. And they have their kids in sports and they treat it as a family sport now. They take it serious. Yeah. Eddie actually went to, it's pretty cool. They were calling me when I was in Louisiana and they went down to, uh, I forgot the organization. BHU. Yeah, BHU. They went down to a BHU Nationals because they have a, a strong youth Nationals there. And he went down there and he won the youth. Na- they picked up Mike on the way through from you. And they took Mike down there and he won it. He won it with Mike down there. He took Mike down there and ran him. And, and he didn't he win it. it with Thor? Or Cash? I thought he won I thought he won Did he Flusher. win both of them? In the, or do they have a youth? I believe they have a youth. They, yeah, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure he won... Maybe maybe I'm incorrect. Maybe I maybe I said I want to say he did, but maybe I'm incorrect. I think he placed, or maybe placed. Uh, yeah, I think he placed second and third, something on like the that. flushing side, and he won it with Mike. Yeah, I know for sure he won it with Mike. And it was cool because there when they're down there, uh, a player down there that was watching Eddie play um, shot me a text message and he said, "Hey man, I just want you to know that this family and this kid is representing your program so great, and you should be proud." And it was pretty cool to get a text message from a player to see that I wasn't there. And the way that Eddie was representing was was great. And Eddie is cool because he's a kid who's learning himself. So, like, at times, he's so uh, so tough on himself. And, and because he has such a family uh, backing, it's almost a detriment to him sometimes. And I've mentioned this before because he'll come out of the field and feel like he let the whole family down. And then the family will go in. And start saying, Eddie, it's okay, it's okay. And then he'll start crying, and he doesn't have a chance to process his emotions. And being a a martial arts instructor, you know, I used to tell the parents, hey, you need to back away for a while when I used to teach kickboxing world championships of 13-year-olds, of back away and let him learn how to grieve because he's got to learn, and he's got that emotional teenager in him. So he has he he's hard on himself, which is fine. He's learning that process. Yep. I mean, I'm proud of him. Um, and then all of a sudden he's got the teenager, I'm cocky, I did this, I just did that, and he bolts around. So then you got to do the other thing as a coach. All right, listen now. You got to be humble a, a, a when you win, humble when you lose, and you got to know that you're learning the process. But this little Ed, he is, I don't know, what is he, five foot? And he goes through the field with his dog and Cash, and they're, the, Cash and Thor were trained by me, and then he runs Mike at, at times in the, in the youth and in open. And he runs the regular men's open and just about got in. He was only like 10 seconds from getting in in the singles division. Then he ran doubles. Frickin' Aaron Hogard. <laughs> yeah. Then he ran doubles with his dad. And I believe it was. And, and, and they ran it with Cash, Cash. Cash. And Cash is their number one stud dog. And Eddie and Cash, Eddie and Nick Dahlman, his dad, got in. So how cool, like Nick talks about all the time. He's like, he goes, I'm out here playing, but I'm really here to just watch Eddie because I watch my son. But the thing about it is Nick's so humble. That I have to smack him up on the side of the head at times. Like, Nick, you're a good player yourself, too, because the emphasis gets around Eddie. The whole family's so involved. I mean, it's so awesome to see. And and I got to smack him up. Like, well, yep, Eddie did this. Eddie did that. Pam, what are we talking about? Nick, will be talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on here. You know, Nick, you did great, too. Because Nick got himself into the finals as well. In the with single, Macy. With Macy. And, uh, and that was actually a chopper puppy that goes back to winning as well. And so, and so it was just, it's cool to see... A family dedicated to the BDC like the Dolmans. They uh, it's and they take their sport serious because then they're in basketball and then they're in horse showing. So I get to hear about what they do and then they also Pam has them in hunt testing. I mean, I um, uh, the two two daughters also love the hunt test. So when I when I take them into uh, to hunt testing last year, both the daughters had did junior hunt titles and I taught and I mentored them how to do hunt tests. Because the same as mentoring tournaments, I also mentor people in hunt test. So it's cool because Pam's like, they're going to learn how to go to the line and what it is to walk these dogs up and what it's going to be like to handle these dogs up here. And so Emily and Haley both ran them. And Haley's older. And Haley from Horse Show, boy, when she goes up and handles a dog in a hunt test, I mean, she's straight business and she knows exactly what she's doing. Emily's younger and she's learning. So Pam puts them in these pressured sports, like these individual sports of hunt testing. Eddie's in these individual sports of, of bird dogging, and, and then he's in basketball. 
I mean, and these kids are are hunting machines already. And then Bill is the grandfather, and he's a hunting, and he helps us too with different logistics at my tournaments and stuff. So I mean, to see a family like them is like the Birkenholzes too. Yep. To see family in the BDC like them is you know important. So here's Eddie and Nick on the finals day because we're work, we're working our ways to the finals now of father son sitting there and where's the other father son sitting across in the finals because what happens is you sequester and sequester means we got to turn our cell phones in so suppose so that nobody can really cheat and it's just so everybody kind of keeps honorable to each other and you stay in a room and you go to the field when you're called upon well another dynamic father son duo is bernie and mav birkenholtz which bernie's been playing for 25 some years and his son, Mav, is like your age, like 22. Or yeah, something. one year older, I think. One year older. And, and Mav's been playing since he's been 15. So here they are. And now, at one point, and when Mav was just like 15, kind of like Nick and Eddie, uh, Bernie just said he had all these different adult players. And he says, you know what? I'm just going to play with my son now and my own dogs. And from then on, Mav had to grow up and being a tournament hunter. And I, I wrote this in some of the social media stuff that was going on at the BDC. I'm like, it's so cool to see that Mav didn't get burnt out with his dad because his dad takes some bird dog. They go pheasant hunting. They travel. They go to Montana. They go to all the Dakotas. Then they go to all the tournaments. And a lot of young teenagers could have got burnt out and like, yeah, dad, I'm into sports more. I don't really care about this bird dog. But Mav shares the same passion with with uh, with Bernie. So they're sitting there as a fa- uh, father-son duo. And then the rest of the competitors. So when you get the finals day, you're just happy to be there. You know, so you had chaos in the doubles with Tony Peterson. And Correct. you had Liv, which was Megan Matthews' dog in the finals. And then we had Puppy, too. And then we had Puppy, which then you had chaos in there once, right? Yep. Okay. So that's what you had. I On finals day, I had Mike in the singles. I had um, Reason and Cowboy in the doubles. And I had Patriot and Reason in the Puppy. So I had some, ni- some nice finals days. That was my finals day. Over. So you're just happy to get there. And let me tell you, when you get the finals day and you're sitting in that room, two-thirds of the people have already packed up and left and went home. Yeah. So you're just proud to be sitting there for any finals you make. And now, Saturday is the day of who's going to be crowning the national champion. Who's going to be crowned it? So when you start with the puppy, um, I had went out there with the puppy and, and I had ran reason. And I just didn't, I just messed up one bird on her run on, on the middle bird. I just took her around it too much. And then my second run was Patriot. And Patriot and I went out and I'm like, ooh, I just ripped one right now. And that could be the national puppy champion right there. And I was very proud of it. And then I had to leave and go run Mike. And I ran a nice one. When I came out, I'm like, that was nice. But I don't think quite nice enough to be the national champion. I left a, about 30 seconds to 40 seconds. And with Bernie being in there multiple times and other guys being in there multiple times, I'm like, yeah, I probably left a little bit too much time for this to be national champion. But it, it was a good run. When we went to the doubles, um, we just missed a uh, taking reason to one of the birds in the field. We just mismanaged the field. And then... And that was just one of our players uh, as a player fault. But when we ran Cowboy, Cowboy got done, and we ripped a pretty dang good with Cowboy. And I'm like, we might be leading this with Cowboy right now. And so so that was my finals day of how, how I was looking. And then Candace was in the puppy with Tim. And Tim went over, and, and he ran her, and he said, yeah, he said there was just like one incident where it didn't work out with, uh, with Candace, but he had her in the puppy. And so, but now... We run those runs, and... You don't know what anybody else has. You don't know what anybody else has. You're sequestered. You're stuck in there. They they take the side-by-side, and they drive you to the fields. And then you run, and they bring you back. And when you get back, you don't want to tell anybody what's going on because you don't want to tell anybody until it's done because you don't want them to know their score or what they got to be. So then you had chaos, chaos and, doubles. and doubles. How did your doubles run go? There? Just mismanaged the field. It was the funny. We made the same yeah. mistake that... Uh, you guys had in your run just didn't take them to a bird right so then it just happens with those rolling terraces sometimes right. you mismanage the field and like we, we how many times have we said before this you leave any time on the table or you make one mistake somebody else ain't gonna make that right. mistake right. so that put us out which is you know you try your best and it's not right. always gonna come together you just do what you can how many times have you told me that do what right. you can and do your best and it'll all yeah. come together 
And when the singles was done on the pointing side, so you had the, the doubles. When the singles was done on the pointing side, Bernie had won it. And uh, Jamin Schultz, which is only 18, had, had got second with his dog. And then Mike had gotten third. And that was the, the top three placements in the pointing. So, so Mike had taken third, and I got third place, which was cool. So Mike, at this year's Nationals, was dog of the year champion. And he took a third in the singles, which was a good showing for him at, um, at that time. Then when the doubles was run, when done, I'm like, we had a pretty good one. Well, when we find out that Cowboy gets beat by his only to be beat by his own daughter, Trixie, who wins it, who was owned by Justin and Randy Hoffman, that but Craig Anderson and Tony Peterson were running her, and they win it, and they, they whip us by like 40 seconds. And in the second, um, who was the second again on that one? Do you remember? Or the second I want to say it was actually uh, Wells. Yeah, I think Wells was the second. But I can't, yeah, remember, Wells which was I can't yeah. remember which dog. Yeah, Travis Wells and I think Mark Moyle were the second on that. And so, and we were all within uh, like 20 seconds of each other. So, I mean, in that. And then Cowboy took third. So his daughter won it. But his daughter is named Trixie, which Trixie is out of Avery, which is out of Journey. So a Journey-Cowboy combination wins it. And then her sire takes third, so his daughter actually beat her. So that was cool. But then when you come to the... To the main event which was the flushing i didn't have a dog in it so i was timmy tim samuel said my buddy had three so i was cheering on him and then i was obviously cheering on you and uh and i'm like okay what's gonna be how's this gonna be but can i ask you one question i guess yeah. I, I guess i've never asked you this who did you have your money on to win it honestly who did you have your money on when well, you were thinking, I, I when had you looked at, I know when it that, that Timmy was going to win it. You, that's what you had. Yeah. No, I was just curious. Yeah. I had, never asked you because yeah, when you have, you want to talk three. about it if you talk yeah, about it. And before we go into this a little bit further, because I jumped for a second here, which I, I, I said I was going to try to save on here. When we got done on the puppy run, and I said I ripped out with Patriot, I never finished, and then you ran chaos, and you said you just in your puppy run, and you said you just had you just had a problem with one bird on there, right? Oh yeah, I just didn't take them to a spot. Take one spot. Uh, like they plant, I thought I got a little yeah. zone focused and thought they'd plant it on a trail, and yes. you know I skipped over a bird and I never took him there. And when I did take him there, he winded it perfectly. It right. just I made the mistake. So I had heard from the wind I was done for the day, and then I couldn't go back in the room. And I had heard that I through the grapevine that I thought I was winning the puppy. So I went down to the puppy to watch it with Craig Anderson and Penny left. You know, one of my best friends. And I watched Craig and Penny put up this flawless run. And I was watching the clock, and I'm like, oh, my God. Craig was just smoking a bird. Penny was just dragging him towards. And to be honest with you, if I was going to be beat, get beat by head, hats off to Craig. Because they ended up beating me by, like, 25 seconds or something. I had a 340. I think Craig had, like, 325 or 320 or some dang thing. And uh, they went out there and just ran this beautiful thing. Craig came out, and he goes... I'm assuming that you did good because you're here. I said, yeah. He goes, so, so what do you think? And I'm like, <laughs> and he's just standing there. I said, I said, you got me. Does that mean I won? I said, yeah. And he just put his hands down and he won the Puppy National Championship, which was also very fitting because Penny had been the number one pointed puppy of the year. And then to be the Puppy National Champion on the end of it was pretty sweet. Yeah. So, and a Patriot took second. So then we ended up there. But jumping back now. Since we have a tendency to do this, you're asking me who my money was on in the finals. You had Liv, and I think Tony, Tony had and, Pyro. Tony had Pyro, and there was other people that were in there. I was just uh, curious to see who you and, had your and money on. I, well, Tim Samuel said has been my tournament hunting partner. We've been driving in the truck for 15 years ago. And knowing his dogs and training his dogs, I knew that if Timmy's got three chances in there, it's going to be hard for him to be in a normal situation. Yep. You know? But he he came out and he, he told me he said mm. I said How, how's everything going he goes nah I just couldn't put it together away for that but, first run because I remember yeah. you talked to him yeah it. and then I'm like and then later on I'm like all right and then I saw you and I'm like well what do you uh, what do you think and you said I I pretty sure I had a good one I just don't know how well it was so I had my money on Timmy but now there's a important piece of the important piece of this puzzle the the when you punch three dogs in, you learning the field, you get more understanding of the field of the placement of the birds, how the bird setters are planting, what cover they're, they're by, and you can kind of start judging that field. You just got more information of the field. But as I always say, and I've written in some of my Friday tidbits, you only need one. You know, so 
And how many so, times did it come down to you and Winnie? Yeah, how many you times know? it just came down to me and Winnie? How many times it came down to me and Journey? How many times it come down to just me and Mike? I mean, Mike, it's been only one for the last four years of his career because I never had another pointer up until I had Candace this year that I ran with Mike. So I always just was down to just me and Mike every time. So, but what, so tell us a little bit about your run in, in this. It was actually in the beginning, they, they actually, you get, like you said, you get transported down or where, where we had to go off the highway and park and wait for them to come get us. So in the moment I was nervous and excited, but like I kind of just sat there and it kind of like all the feelings kind of left away. And I just felt like I had one job to do. And that was just go smoke this, play the field, how it's going to be played. Don't take unnecessary risks and put my birds down. I knew she was going to do her job. So I'm sitting in the blind, and uh, I told you about this, that freaking it was just bringing up good memories of lives in the in the crate, and they're planting my birds, and she's just going ape shit wild, barking, just can't wait to get out. And so that's getting me a little bit jacked up. And then next you know, I, I cinch her up and uh, drop her off, and the weirdest thing happened where she walked to the line just perfectly, like just like synced up with me in that moment. Like, you know, you have those times, but usually she comes out very hot and just ah, bouncing off the walls. I just want to go. But like in that moment, it seemed like she knew what we were, what we were about to do, even before I knew what we were about to do. Right. And I sit her down and she looks up at me and I see those eyes and um, I'm thinking to myself, okay, let's just do this girl. And I cat, uh, ship her out. And next thing you know, I, I take, she just takes this gorgeous line. Next thing you know, within five seconds, her ears are up and she just walks in. This bird, it was actually a little bit deeper. Just walks in, puts it up, I dump it. And the funny part is I saw the head fly off. That was a cool part of my run that I distinctly remember. And then take her to the front and I get that. She just walks in the next bird. I'm like, holy crap, okay. Well, the, what I'm looking for, gate bird, gate bird right away. So I book it to the middle again. Bird, bird was there, walks it in. Just like I'm putting her in the zone. It's like one of those runs where you put the dog there and it's just walking it in. No questions asked, no wasting time. Swing her across the middle. I got to skip the middle zone because how you touch down those plant cards that I know I can't have two double stackers next to each other. So that's what going in my head. When I hit that middle right and I already had a front, front uh, middle and a front right, I can't have a middle middle. So I zoomed it across the middle. Went to the middle left, didn't hit nothing. I said, okay, how many times have I heard you say this? I'm trusting you, girl. Let's go to the back. Right. So I take her to the back. Ears up again. I'm like, holy crap. She's just walking these in. Puts that one up. I dump it. And now it comes down to how many said we, we call this the money bird. And the funniest part is usually I'm a little bit more nervous on the last bird. But I don't remember. Things were going so quick at that moment that I don't, I don't even think. I think I was ready to keep going after the fifth bird. Yeah. I'm glad he shut the watch off, though. And, uh. <laughs> I she put just I put her right in the back middle, ears up again. I'm like, holy crap, we're smoking. She puts it up, I dump it for her. Well, Liv has a tendency to drive in so hard like Journey, but when the bird gets up, she's still driving in, trying to just flush it because she's not trying to figure out where it is. When she hits that scent, you'll see like versus Cowboy. When she hits center Journey, they pile drive to that scent where Co Cowboy and Chaos out of Cowboy walk catwalk that bird and figure out exactly where it is and then pounce on it where they don't. So the bird gets up and goes like this. And I dump and shoot where she kept running that way. So I spent 20 seconds trying to get her, 20, 25 seconds trying to get her to handle. And you know by hunt tests that when they're in hunt mode, it's hard to get them out of hunt mode, especially when you're actually literally in hunt mode trying to get them in hunt test mode. So that was that was brutal. But I finally got her, finally got her to sit where I got her out of hunt, hunt mode. Just give her a nick on the collar, tweet my whistle, get her to sit, give her this. Thank God she was trained by Michael Michael D. Vaughn at Wingmaster Academy. Gave her an angle back left. Next thing you know, she takes that cast and wins it, brings it to me. And, I, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. Okay, I couldn't wait to ask the judge what was my exact time. And he says, you ran a 346. And I said, am I leading it? I played that little gamemanship that Mike taught me. He said, well, am I leading it? And he said, I can't tell you that. And I said, well, I ain't got no more runs in here. You could tell me. And he's like, you're leading it by six seconds. So then what was going through my mind is that with that 20 seconds, a little mishap, I left 20 to 25 seconds on the table. Right. And then I came back and I talked to Mike. And Mike was the only one I talked to about it was uh, I said, I ran a nice, really nice run with Liv. And they say I'm leading it. But I was in the middle. And I was at like 1 o'clock in right. the afternoon. So I, that was what, one thing that we kind of didn't touch on but like with, with brackets. But finals isn't bracketed. Right. You're randomly drawn order. So right. I was running at one of the upcoming hottest part of, part of the day in the right. driest. It got hot during that time. And she just did, just did it flawlessly. And uh, I come back to Mike, 
and I say I ran a really nice run, but with Timmy being in there, and I told you this exact thing, with Timmy being in there three times and me leaving 20 to 25 seconds on the table, I don't think I'm going to have it. If, right. if I wouldn't have had that little mishap, I'm like, oh, I'd be feeling a lot better. Right. I'd be feeling a lot better. So then, uh, and the day didn't go any, the day couldn't have went any slower after that. It was just crazy. <laughs> so then, uh, turns out, I couldn't wait that. I, I, we found out that all the runs, and I was kind of listening to what everybody was talking about, and I, everybody seemed to have quite a bit of trouble in that field. And then Tony said he didn't do anything, and I was actually worried about Tony too at Pyro, and he said he didn't, um, he missed a gate bird on it when he was talking to me about it. Not miss, but like with, it was just with the conditions. He was running at the hottest part because he went right after me. I saw him driving out when I was driving back. and uh, But I was just kind of listening to talks, and I didn't hear anything faster. And there was one guy that said he had a really nice time. And I'm like, ooh, I wonder if that was the 352 that I, I was talking about. And sure enough, when the the boards got posted, Liv and, just, Liv and I had just won the national championship. And I wanted to touch on this, that when I when I talked about like Liv bringing up or barking the whole time with her crate, it seemed like I was just going back to being with Winnie and uh, how she would look up at me. Winnie started, and I know I talked about this in – previous podcast but when he started tournament hunting for me like really got me hooked running with such an experienced dog she made tournament hunting so enjoyable for me she got me my first ever win she always knew how how you said she always knew how you were feeling she always knew like when I walked up to the line I knew she was going to do her job right. and she just I, I've said it on previous runs she seemed like she was really with me and on my biggest runs like with Carmen's first ever run at four months old you know, this run, it seemed like Winnie was right there beside me, yeah, showing me what cool. to do. Being, It's just like she was guiding me through that whole run. And that's, I, and I honestly believe it because it just seems like things happen like that. And it was so special for me that now when I saw my name and Liv's name to go on the trophy that, well, this is actually her trophy that yeah. she won in 2020, 2021, but, or 2022, but for 2021. But it's so special to know that a dog that started it all for me and I get to be next to her name on that trophy because they have uh, previous winners. But not only that, I was also I was so excited because your name's on there twice and I and I get to be with with like legends. It, yeah. it, that's how oh, I yeah. felt. And being next to you and, you know, I, I one thing that I noticed that I never really told anybody and I think this is a good part is I tend to put – we talk about pressure and I tend to put a lot of pressure on myself that I've learned to let go and just have fun and do what I can and do my best and trust the process because right. I work for you. Cause I, in the beginning and, and still now I want to make you proud and right. stuff like that. So, but you tend to, you tend to do worse when you put that kind of pressure on yourself. Right. I know that if I make a mistake, you know what, guess what? It happens to you too. Right. It happens to Timmy. It happens to right. Tony. It happens to everybody. Mistakes right. happen to everybody. Right. And it can happen, you know, whenever, anytime. You just right. got to try and minimize those mistakes. So it's a really special feeling to know that my name's going up there. Megan's is going up there because she owns Liv. And just to be next to you, yeah. it, it was really That's special. Sweet. It was really special. And we looked at the trophy here, and Alec is the youngest on the flushing side to ever win the BBC National Champion. The youngest handler ever. So, I mean, that is awesome with only really being tournament hunting for like a year, seriously. Yeah. In terms of like. the class, It'll be a year this week. Oh, we're leaving for. Yeah. Well, well you'll be getting this podcast on Friday and that's yeah. when we're leaving. Well, that's we're leaving right. the date Thursday. Right. And, and what were you saying about the podcast now? Oh, yeah. One of the one of the first things that came to mind once once I won, other than how grateful and blessed I felt for, for having those kinds of opportunities and working under you and learning from you as my mentor that uh, <laughs> I, I laugh. I told you right away. I said on our podcast description, it says join host multinational and world BDC champion Mike Vaughn. And then it just says and co-host out Kisley. And I told him now I can finally say and co-host one time <laughs> national champion Alec Kisley. So I was all. I was all pumped up yeah, about that. Yeah, he was just pumped up that we had to change the description on the way. I saw we're changing on everything now. One time multinational, <laughs> one time one national time. champion. Oh, yeah, he's, he's got he's right up there now. He gets all these cool prefixes and I didn't have nothing, so I had to change that. <laughs> but going off of that, I just wanted to say uh, I talked about Winnie and how I'm very grateful, but I also want to say I'm very grateful for you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Thank thanks, you for brother. everything. You, no problem. You have... 
lit a fire inside me from the first tournament where, you know, I've been doing this consistently with chaos for, it'll be a year this weekend, but I, I ran my first ever tournament with Chester at your tournament top right. gun, but that was only other than Packerland. So it's been pretty much right. a year, a little over a year me doing this, but you've taught me pretty much everything I've known and under you having 15 years of experience and working under you, I'm so grateful for all the conversations that we've been able oh, yeah. to have. You know, you you get to watch my runs and you get to say, Alec, you just smoked that. You you couldn't have played that field any better. Or when I come back and I know I screwed up, but I see him watching, Alec, what the hell were you doing over there? <laughs> what were you doing over there? I'm like, I know, like you know, those You're that right. constructive criticism has made me a better player. And I would not be the player that I am today without you, your guidance. And, you know, you, you teach me, you, you let me in on the secrets, even though, yeah. you know, a lot of – not something you just tell anybody and something that would take me years to pick up. You want right. me to be the best player and that's how you are as a mentor. And I just want to say yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, for you everything. got it, brother. Hell yeah, you deserve it. I was proud of you. I got to say that that was a very proud moment. I was proud for Megan too because Megan and I have been friends for over a decade and she's and she's built a breeding program and I trained her first dog, Lacey, and now Liv and now she's got Lyric. And, uh, and she took second with Lyric and third with Liv in the ladies division at the national championships herself because she's a ladies player. And and so I was happy for her because I've also watched her build the breeding program, very dedicated breeder. She's actually raised some litters for me before too in the past. So it was really neat to see her get what you deserve, see what you get to deserve. But like I told you, this sets you up now to win with your own dog. Because what you got to do is even though your own personal dogs bring out more of an emotion you got to learn to set them aside and take your emotions out of it and become a champion with your your own dogs. exactly and and so you did the right thing like i told you when you're done i said hey i'm proud of you for still giving a hundred percent with somebody else's dog because no matter what dog's in front of you if you got the opportunity to be in a nationals you give a hundred percent no matter what it what it is and some people in the past don't do that and we've always ran ours ours that way you've told me so many times that even in doubles with timmy Say, uh, cowboy, you go and rip a uh, a four minute run with cowboy. Just say four minute, and you're smoking it. And that's a smoking time for that field. And then here you are with Timmy with Raven, who's won a doubles national championship. Yeah. And you're at three thirty, and you're you're going to your fifth burn. You know exactly where it is. Well, you tell Timmy, whoa, whoa, let's waste thirty seconds so then cowboy can get his first national championship. You would never do that. You're right. You told me that you let the best dog win, right. no matter whether it's your dog or not. You're right. No matter what, you always you, work you let the best dog win because right. that's because if, if you 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 make another dog win, right? Well, they didn't deserve it. That's like right. what Justin right. actually beat him beat himself out in the puppy division. I can't remember what tournament it was, but he won it. He ran Penny and won it with Penny, and Trixie took second, and he beat him his own dog out. Right. Yep. Yeah, Justin Hoffman. Actually. But you let the best. You that's what you always tell right. me is no matter what you're doing, you let the best dog win. Right. And you don't know. You know, I think that used to be a little more prevalent in the older days where you could be like, okay, let's say I want a journey to get a national championship and winning and hold him back. But you don't know what other people did. That's the, that's the scary yeah, part. Yeah, so that's the scary part. So you don't ever do that. You let the chips uh, chips land where they fall. You know, I the, I look at the, the sport of tournament hunting and, you know, like I, I believe I mentioned earlier about what this podcast is all about, about building the sport through this podcast. There is no other tournament hunting podcast. So we're gonna get BDC guests on here of Tournament Hunters on here, which I'm excited about. And and the guests that we got coming too is what we, what we were talking about. But, so we're gonna start getting more guests on, on this on this podcast. But I, I look at the sport as, as a saving grace for me because coming, I mean, I think Timmy and I were, were two adrenaline junkies for wanting to fight in the cage. I mean, we're MMA fighters. And when we both needed to retire and grow up a little bit because our careers weren't going to make it to the UFC, either one of us just quite had it to get to that level or you're going to have to sacrifice way too much to go there at that period of your life. All right, well, then you go, all right, what's our next one? Well, we put on tournament hunting together. I fought it first and then Timmy joined with me. And then we drove around the country together, building this dream together and we built up. So when I talk about genetics and shooting and this... Well, Tim and I were the same amount of hours in the truck. When I talk about mentoring, like I didn't really have a mentor. I learned from certain guys that took certain things with that Bruce Lee quote. You know, probably my biggest mentor in terms of helping me mental management and everything was my own best friend, Tim Samuelson, because 
I like you and I drive in the truck and I mentor you to okay you got to think about this you got to do that you got to do this I well him and I would have these conversations back and forth to each other and then we would help each other we'd help each other mental manage to make each other better so I had a best friend to drive in the truck with and that is something special I think anytime you're done with a tournament and you're feeling bad you need to have somebody you can call to sort of filter your emotions and your thoughts of your performances so like I get a lot of calls from people that that want to filter their thoughts that I'm having a problem here. Well, it's usually just a mental process. You know, I'm so crazy about processes. I'm so crazy about mental management. I'm so crazy about systems. I love the sport so much. So I guess like from a standpoint of, of course, as a player, I want to win all the time. You know, that's, that's the player in me. There's times I got to, set people aside and be like, hey man, nothing personal, but I'm done talking for the day. I need to focus on myself. I need to focus on Because it I, takes a toll. When yeah, it takes keep... a toll when everybody wants my attention. Everybody wants to talk to me. On say like you, you yeah. and you hear yeah. that, like say at Nationals, I say yeah. I missed twice and I keep yeah. bringing it up. Yeah. Too. That is mentally affecting you. Yeah, like somebody toll. will come over to me and they'll want to tell me their funeral, their whole run of how bad it went. And they're casting it on me. Well, and dragging you and down. And dragging me down and sucking my energy out. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, get a beer tonight and come find me. I need to stay focused on my my task at hand. A lot of people like to do that because they know that I understand and because I'm a mentor or because they look up to me or they respect me. And I, and I like talking to people. Like, I'll never snob anybody like I mentioned in a lot of these. But when it comes to being a competitor, I'll be like, hey, for now, I can't take your energy. You're sucking some energy out of me as a player. So come talk to me tonight. I'll listen to your stuff tonight. But right now, I got to stay focused on my own dogs. You know, one thing that I haven't really mentioned... I don't think much is I really don't run other people's dogs into BDC. I do it in hunt test. That's my job. I, I handle dogs for other things. And I think I might've mentioned this in the air podcast, but to go back to it, I love chaining my dogs out, airing them and looking at my own dogs and being like, it's you and I, it's, I bred you. I trained you. I want the bond. I want to win with you. And I don't care about any other team here but you and I. That's, And so I get to have a pride moment where it's just me and my dogs. I go to a hunt test. Let's say I got 10 dogs. Let's say I got Patriot on there. And Patriot smokes it. Okay, and I'm on my way home. Well, then I got to explain to somebody that dog that didn't. Well, it takes away from my personal dog. I can't even be excited for my own dog. I'm like, well, I'd almost rather have the client dog pass then Patriot pass. And that's the same reason yeah. in the BDC. If, yeah. if you do good yeah. with your own dog, say you yeah. want it with your own dog and do yeah. crap with somebody else. Yeah. yeah, same thing. So so that's why I don't run other people's dogs in BDC. Timmy and I, and I said this before, I kept it to where, nope, we're not going to. If I do have an opening, I'd run some of my client dogs for it. Okay, then there's a specific set of rules of how I run that dog for them. And we talk about that before it starts. Here's how it's going to go. Here's how... Things are in a procedure. I'm running this dog for this reason. And this is how everything's going to go. And you're going to know right up front how this is going to work. Yep. Right? And But I rarely run other dogs for other people. And so that's that part. And my pride in my dogs is why tournament hunting is created. If you didn't think you could go and be a national champion with your own dog and win it and be the best dog hunter combination there, then why would you even go? Yep. You know? And, I mean, of course, you could argue and say, because I want to go to nationals and just compete with the best and hang out and be around the best. Okay, that's you can experience. That's right. But in general, at some point in time, you need in your DNA to say, hey, I want to be a national champion. You know, that's... And then and then the end of it, of being a mentor and being an advocate of the sport and bringing more people to the sport, and, I, and like, I'm mentoring more people right now that are that are going to be build, building. Like, I, like, right now, I can talk about Aaron Hogarth is where I think he's, like, the rookie of the year. Like, he's he's rocking it right now. And, and he's another friend of mine that I've, that he said, Hey, build me a tournament dog. Can I learn how to do it? He's come to the seminars. He's, he's been here training with me. He's, he's bought into the Wingmasters lifestyle as, as well. He does his own thing. And, and, and so, and that as a mentor is like, okay, that makes me feel really good because I am doing like, I'm giving back to the sport and to watch my genetics go in somebody else's hands and do well, I mean, it's rocking. To watch me train a dog that somebody else wins with is rocking. So I kind of get to, I'm kind of lucky because I get to vicariously live through everybody kind of right now because I built it up. So, and now I'm doing the same thing on the pointer side. And like, some people would call it, call us crazy for what we do. But until yeah. 
I wish that everybody in the world had a passion like what you have for tournament hunting or yeah. what I, how I have it because I I cannot wait like before a tournament yeah. like thinking about the classic right now I'm just excited I go to bed thinking about the classic already right or the next, even <laughs> we were talking about this summer you know we're, we're here training dogs seven days a week you know we're taking care of dogs it's right. non-stop here you're running hunt tests on the weekend um I might be drinking a bloody with you at a hunt test on the weekend yeah. or whatever but I remember and we're just you're, we're busting our butts all summer, but Mike would come. I'd, I'd show up, start taking care of dogs in the morning with Mike, and he said, "Hey, Alec, only 105 more days until the Top Gun Championship." <laughs> and then, and then the next day I'd show up, Alec. There's only 104 more days until the <laughs> Top Gun Championship. And eventually, I remember him saying, Alec, there's only one more day until the Top Gun Championship." Yeah. You know, there's such a passion. I just, I, it is so that competitiveness. That's what I love about that. Going up to the right. line, I want to be the best. Right, but the thing is, at any tournament, anybody can be the best. You have to do the process consistently, eliminate mistakes to be the best. But just that, I think this is really important. Just because I went and won the national championship with Lib, and I'm going to the classic with her, also yep. there is no guarantee that I'm going to win the classic championship with her. Right, no, it starts it, over. It's it's a completely new tournament, so I could be over. I could be potentially bumped out in the first round. You never know how it goes, but all I know is I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to trust the process, and I'm going to try to perfect the process in order to have the best chances of doing what I want to do with her. That's 100, percent and with your own dog as well, and with my own dog as well. Yeah, you're. Here's the funny thing I told you before, and it's a true story. And I tell everybody this: you get one day of fame off of a win. Exactly. Everybody will congratulate you on Saturday and the Sunday. And then everybody forgot. By on Monday, everybody forgot about what the Nationals was. And if you if you had a bad Nationals and you left on, on Wednesday or Thursday, you already forgot about when you left there. You don't even care who won it. Exactly. Because you're thinking about the next one you need to go to. You know? So, and and that's what's funny about it. So now we're going to a classic whole new tournament. People already forgot who. who yep. We're, we're bringing up who all the national winners and what happened at the nationals. Because we wanted to cover it. Because we wanted to cover it. And we're covering it as almost like sport analysts. <laughs> Sports analysts, you know. ESPN. And ESPN right here. BDC. ESPN. BDC, ESPN. So, and, and those people are already on to their next one, but I'm already on to it. If we oh, weren't yeah. talking about it, I already forgot who won the nationals. Me too. You know, so you're, and even if you win it, you forget about it. We're on to the next one. You're so focused on, you have to leave yeah. the past and now you're on to the next one. You yeah, keep you're holding on to the, on to the past. Right. And you, and every tournament's a, a new opportunity. There's a lot, like for me, that goes behind, behind the scenes of what goes on. So I appreciate your help. First off of help me train the dogs and becoming a hell of a trainer. First off of your dedication to wing masters and lifestyle. First off, I appreciate your passion because I love having the conversations that we have to. I appreciate you conditioning the dogs and doing what I say in order to, to Villa. So you're like a huge part and you're like my right hand man, not only in the kennel operations, but now in getting wing masters lifted off the ground. The the you know, wing masters is going to be about the fact that you're going to be able to learn how to shotgun your own, learn how to shotgun yourself, train your own dog, how to play the sports because we're going to have a tournament hunting section, a hunt test. You're going to be able to get into it and get into the wing master lifestyle and do it yourself even. Come to our seminars and meet us and you're going to, man, I mean, it's going to be a cool day when somebody tells me that they showed up at a seminar and they did all the wing masters and they can't wait to play. And I never even met them before. That's going to be a whole new realm of my business, right? All right. So, but for me, like I have so many moving parts that that goes. So like there's so many things for me. So while you're gone and I leave Louisiana and you leave Wisconsin and we're meeting at the National, well, one of the most passionate women I've ever had in my life and dogs that I grew up with was my Aunt Terry Bride. She actually was the first person ever. She had golden retrievers. And when I was a kid, I always admired her. I told her, Hey, can you convince my parents to get me a golden retriever? <laughs> right back then. And then I fell into the Beagles and we talked about that on the air podcast. But, but I mean, she actually was the first one and my uncle to introduce me to bird. And my aunt has this intuition and this instinct of dogs and she loves them. So she actually took care of the kennel the whole week while we're gone. And she has a full-time job. So she had to go come here in the morning, be here at 4 a.m., take her lunch breaks, come to the kennel, get done with, the, get done with work, come back to the kennel for you know 10 days while you were gone right i leave it louisiana and i'm staying down there on that property 
And Sean Varville is down there, and I say, hey, here's what I want you to do for the week to keep these dogs main, maintained so I don't lose any traction with where I'm getting going. Here, I need you to take care of these dogs. And then he's down there in Louisiana keeping the dogs going and passion. And Sean's got a huge passion for dogs, too, and has a huge passion for hunt testing. And he understands it. And we have good conversations, and he's down there taking care of, like, my south kennel, my north kennel. So my Aunt Terry's up here in the north kennel. Sean Varville's down in the... So, so I want to thank my Aunt Terry and Sean Varville for allowing, and like Sean says, and my Aunt Terry says, our goal is to not have to call you with any problems. So you guys can just go have a week where you guys don't have to worry about anything and we're going to take care of the dogs. And they did, and they did a phenomenal job. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. And so I want to thank you guys for allowing Alec and I to be at Nationals worry-free and allowing the clients to be worry-free because these dogs are well taken care of. Or I wouldn't allow these people to take care of them, exactly. right? And then, while I'm on that, I want to thank um, Garrett, Charlie, and Cindy Neal for the hot Southern Hospitality. They're they're great friends of mine, and I get to go down there and be like with a Southern family. So when I'm down south, uh, they're with Palmetto Creek Gun Dogs, and I don't go down there feeling like I'm an inconvenience. I just feel like family. We go out to eat, we have cookouts, we talk at night, we sit down and BS. We, I mean, it's really cool. It's it's so cool. And then when they come up here in the summertime, at times to train or hang out and, and go grouse hunting stuff with me, I treat them the same way. So it's a it's awesome to have a Southern family, you know, when I'm away. So, and then, you know, I want to thank my sponsors, the American Natural Dog Food. We feed American Natural Premium Dog Food here. And, and it's what feels our dogs. And we know the formulas in which we want for the time of year we want, what formulas we want our dogs on. And uh, I've had a lot of people switch to the dog food since they've had their dogs trained here. And they sponsor me. And I would not feed the dog food or just for a sponsorship. The reason why I mention them is because I believe in their product. You know, I want to thank our sponsor, uh, Ben Bryan and B Mountain Knife Works. Like we're working right now on a rocking, a rocking bird flaying knife that's custom that we can sharpen whenever we want to, to breast our birds out. And I can't wait to be able to show this when we release this. That's going to be. That's going to be a, a, a rocking a rockin time. I love to thank Sheila at Scattered Acres because she makes you feel like home when you get there for a week. Oh, my God. Sheila Rogue it, owns Scattered Acres. And when you get there, she sets you up, and she's like, just treat the place like yourself, and we just go around, and we have a great time. Her, The guys that set up the fields, her setup, her, her setup crew, she gets the bird setters. She gets the judges. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it's phenomenal. On what I was, you know, Mike Mulvaney, that was the marshal the whole week. I want to thank him at the BDC Nationals. These are all people that have big roles in making things go. Thanking all the judges and all the bird setters because you got to think all the judges and all the bird setters are walking miles and running miles to plan our birds all week to give us the most fairest competition we can have. And we have just top notch judges. And it was and, amazing this it year. It was amazing this year. Um, and then I want to thank uh, Mandy Samelstad, who's the office administrator for the BDC. She, she deals with the score. She deals with the people paying their their uh, their entry fees. She deals with keeping track of the the run order. She deals with printing everything out. So I mean, it's a it's a big big job. And she just it was her first nationals that she she did this year since the new BDC ownership. And what a rocking job! And then Tim Samuel said, being BDC owner of how how he handled things with Mandy and things like that. I mean, it was just a it was very very. The, the BDC was ran really, really good. So I, I want to thank uh, you guys for for that at that point. So, and then, you know, lastly, I want to thank everybody who is I'm posting the social media and we're posting the support. Wing, the support. I mean, it's so cool to get comments of you guys saying, go kick butt, go to the guys. It's cool to get text messages. It's cool to get Facebook messages. It's cool to you guys comment on my posts. I try to keep up with the social media as best we can, but literally, we're from the time you wake up till the time the day ends. There's something going on, you know, and it's and it's and that's why we call it the marathon of bird dogging. Oh my gosh! But I mean, wingmasters of the lifestyle. We explained it to you. This is we're we're got some awesome puppies here right now that are going to oh, be filmed. filmed. It's going to be it's going to be an awesome summer of filming. If we can ever get the snow outside, it's flying by us to go get away from here. I think uh, the perfect thing to end on would be what you initially told me today. Something new that you came up with that I I just loved, and you, you've been holding it back on me. Yeah, you finally told me about it yeah. today when we were talking about training. 
Yeah, let's uh, let's let's end on on this. I. I'm addicted to processes, and you hear me say the process a lot. And originally, when I was talking about the Wingmasters Train Along program, I was calling it the TAP, Train Along program. It's a marketing term, and it's also our acronym for what's going to happen when you guys are able to log in. I mean, the website is going to be starting to be built in May, so I'm working on getting everything put together ready. And it's going to start with all the breeding program and the in-house training services and and the history of everything and all the accolades, and then it's gonna move in to start getting our, start putting up our videos and start putting our, our system in. But I, I'm i so intrigued with processes, and I think we can end on this because anybody can understand this of any sport, any dog training, anything you do. And I wrote this in a Friday tidbit, so you might read the tidbit before you even get the podcast, right? And I just it's already pre-written for, for us this week. And it is, if you start anything, if you're going to do anything new, and I'm just going to use shotgunning as an example. You want to shoot a shotgun. There's an, the first day thing you do when you're shotgunning, and there's an end point of what you do when you're shotgunning. And there's a midpoint. The first day you decide you want to get go bird hunting, what's the first thing you do? You have to go to the store. Feel what gun fits right for you, what feels good for you, what brand you can afford, and buy yourself your shotgun, right? Okay, that's day one starting. You have to own a shotgun to kill a bird, right? Then, what's the end point? You kill a bird with your shotgun, all right? What's the midpoint? The midpoint is the process from the day you get your shotgun to the day you kill a bird with it to the day you go run a tournament with it to the day you go wild bird hunting with it. The end point is hunting and competition hunting, right? Or just one or the other or both. And what's the midpoint? Okay, well, let's talk about the midpoint because the midpoint is the process. Okay, I need the specific chokes in there. I need a specific uh, ammo. I need to learn uh, which way I, the safety of which my barrels need to be doing so I'm safe around people. I need to learn how to, the four, the different positions of mount positioning as I'm going. I learn, need to learn about sw my swing. I need to learn about following through. I need to learn about hand-eye coordination. I need to learn about anticipation of the bird. I need to learn about how I'm going to fall through through on the bird. I need to learn. Uh, Learn about how I'm going to keep the, the dog in rage, how I'm going to read the birdiness, how I'm going to set my feet, where's my hips at, how I'm going to turn on, on, on the angle. Okay, that is your midpoint. Well, your midpoint is your process. Now, if any one of those things is taught wrong, when you go to your end point, you'll be like, oh, man, I went and shot a bird and I'm missing birds. So if you just got a shotgun and went bird hunting, your chances of shooting birds is pretty low. Right? Because you don't even know what chokes are. You don't know what ammo you got. We talked about a podcast about you and your dad that time you came. I had to give you the ammo. First time you came here, you had the wrong shot. You know, go back and listen to that. Pound of yeah, you're BB a pound shot. of a BB shot. Okay, so you got the wrong steps in a chronic archery. But if you were mentored right and you had the right system like Wingmasters is, you would chronologically order to your endpoint. Now, if your endpoint ends up to where your endpoint there's something wrong with it. You will go back to your midpoint. So let's say I have a hard time on rising birds. I would go back to my midpoint. I would work on rising bird shots on a trap shot and practice how I got to cover the bird above it instead of at it so that I don't miss these shots when they're a rising bird. You go back, you fix that, you bring it back to your endpoint. Now when you go and compete again or you go shoot birds, it's like, oh, okay, I'm killing rising birds because what did I do? I went, I took my endpoint that I was having a problem with, fixed it in my midpoint and put it back in my endpoint. And what happens? I keep making my endpoint tighter and tighter and better and better. And I keep repeating the process of my endpoint to make it better. Then what do I do with it? I go try to make limits in my game bag, or I go try to beat my process against somebody else in a competition, which is bird dogging, right? And tournament hunting. That's the process of which you do something. If you decide to just do that process week, well, then you're just not going to be able to get at the high level. The highest level people in any sport you know rodeo you got jb mooney you got you know michael jordan you got the brett Favre's, you know all of your your top baseball players you can think of your top pitchers any top sport person go does their processes over and over perfectly and what are they working on practicing making their processes better and better and more efficient and back to that quote i said about bruce lee we're constantly trying to put in little useful things little useful things to make our 
our process is so much better. So for me, it's a never ending um, process of making myself better. And I think why people enjoy being around me and why we enjoy having these conversations and you and I do and everybody else that's that's friends of mine in the tournament hunting world is because we just enjoy talking about these things. We keep them mental and we like gleam off each other's knowledge to make each other better. And that's one thing that's happened in the BDC right now. The competition is getting so high that it's just unbelievable because how the mental process of each player just keeps getting stronger and stronger as people keep gleaming off each other. I think people are really going to benefit going off of your your – new tap program that you call it, which I love, train along process, is before Wingmasters was even a twinkle in your eye, you told me about isolation and integration. And that's exactly what you're going to be doing with the tap program. You're right. going to isolate something in the midpoint. Say you're doing force fetching. He's coming back and fumbling with the bird. You're going to isolate the hold and hear command right. with a real bird and or, or a dead bird. And then you're going to integrate it back in once you've completed that, say, for a week drill. That they call you and ask you a question about, hey, my dog keeps chomping on a bird. Okay, well, you're going to isolate this specific thing, work on it for a week, don't do nothing else, and right. integrate it back into the true process. Isolation and integration. Right. And in which you want all that process to become is action without thought. In the, in the dog's mind and eventually in your own mind, you have to operate out of a strong process of your subconscious. And that's a whole nother and a whole nother podcast. But that's you know, that's getting to a higher level of thinking. That's what the highest level players think. You know, it's it's just fun to discuss this. I know that like we went into a deep podcast on here. And if you've hung with us this far, it's you know, we've been going at it for quite a while. But it if you truly listen to the words of what we're saying, you're you're gonna become a better player in anything you do. So even if you don't do bird dogging and you're just a fan of the what we talk about, this all relates to anything that you're that you're a sport about. If you're a bird dogger or you're becoming a better hunter or you want to compete, this all works. And if you just want to be a better hunter and never want to compete, this all still works on how to fill your game bag. It all works for hunt testing, everything like that. So I appreciate you guys hanging with us on, on episode number four. I think it's been a strong one. I'm proud of you, Alec, for being Thank the you. national champion. Um, we're, we got lots of cool things coming up. So each year to end this, each year what I what I do is two seminars a year. I do a, a waterfall and hunt test seminar. That date's going to be coming up for some time in June. I always do my annual upland hunting seminar and tournament hunting seminar the second weekend in August. It's always the second weekend in August. Mark it on your dates right now, guys, for that. second. I think it's around the 12th or 13th or 14th or something this year. Mark your dates and you'll see the flyer coming out that for that on our social media. Come meet Alec and I. Come train with us. Come learn these processes. Come come see what it's like to be tournament. Hunter. Come feel our energy. Come have a good time. Because we're we're excited to meet the people as they're going of of who want to get into this bird dogging lifestyle, which is what Wingmasters is all about. But guys, thank you for hanging with us. It's been a great thing. Good to be back thank in you. The, good to be back in the old uh, Wingmaster studio with you, Alec. And uh, we're signing out for not for for tonight. We're signing out to have a good time. We hope to see you guys soon and enjoy. We'll be back in a few weeks. Thank you.